Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Tonight we have stories that will make your skin crawl, make the goosebumps rise, put a tingle down your spine, and maybe get you to walk over to the door to make sure it's locked. But we're not talking folklore here. The stories you're going to hear are absolutely, positively true. Tonight, the latest project in the chilling Missing 411 series. This one is called Missing 411 Off the Grid. So you're a busy guy, and you have a lot of irons in the fire, but not even you can be everywhere. I guess, uh, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I see all these links and clips and mini films online here and there, and it looks like you're all over the place. But then I look closer, and it isn't you. What's going on? That is very disturbing. And uh, our we have a YouTube site called Can-Am Missing. And that's the only YouTube site I have. Nothing under my name, nothing under Missing 411. But you're going to see a lot of channels out there that say David Politis or Official Missing 411. And we've asked for YouTube to take them down. They won't do it. Uh, but the Can-Am Missing Project YouTube site, you're going to watch a series of videos that we've made. We've gone on scene where some of these people have disappeared. But it's a very frustrating ordeal. And I've talked to George Norrie about this that you guys experience the same thing about people pirating your broadcasts and putting them on different channels as well. Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, it is it is frustrating, of course, because you're spending time and money putting this stuff together, and uh, people just pilfer it. Um, it is, and uh, they, kind of, they kind of play it to their own paradigm. They, they're pushing some kind of agenda, agenda usually, and they, they'll say things like, well, this is really what he meant, and he just doesn't want to say it, or he really knows what's happening, and this is what it is. And I've never done any of that. So it, 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 I get emails all the time from people saying, well, we saw this on your website. Uh, and I go, no, 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 that isn't my website. That isn't even my YouTube channel. And, you know, it, you probably have had the same thing happen to you. It gets frustrating. I, I know the last time you were here, we talked about the movie. Uh, what's going on with that? So uh, Ben and Mike DeGrazier, uh, the two directors, I mean, they, they worked with you on part of it, and uh, I think they did a really good job. And it, Coast to Coast and uh, you and George Nori were both really, really helpful in allowing us to use almost anything associated with Coast. And since they kind of put me on the map, we used that Coast to Coast intro for the beginning of the movie and it, the transition point, and it worked out well. And um, Ben and Mike did a good job in taking these five disappearances of these young boys that we went into the field, talked to the parents, got real insight into what happened, and then we turned around and we used Les Stroud, Survivor Man, to try to replicate this one journey that this boy made in the middle of the woods. And it's, it's a pretty powerful movie in that we're dealing with real-life issues, boys that couldn't have made that journey on their own, and Les Stroud couldn't have made it, and he admitted it, he couldn't do it. And uh, the response... <laughs> The response has been interesting. There's a, an individual that you know, uh, John Barber, and uh, he was a movie critic for the L.A. Times and for NBC. And he reviewed it for um, his channel, and he called it the best documentary of 2017. And he, he commented to me offline. He said, you know, Dave, he goes, what's unreal is I've never seen a documentary with so many one-star ratings and so many five-star ratings. It almost looks like somebody is attacking you at, and trying to dismount that off uh, a higher-level performance. And he goes, I don't understand why. And it almost does. There's a whole bunch of one-stars on there that don't make any sense. Well, we can speculate about who might be responsible for that, and we might get into a little bit of that uh, later. One other thing I wanted to ask you about is I know um, – that talking to you over the years that you've been approached about TV shows, because it would be a natural with this much material, a series could go on and on. Is that happening? So uh, I've probably been a, 
approached at least once a week for the last two years by different production companies all over the world. And when you get down to the brass tactics of, of dealing with them, and after doing my own movie, I kind of know what I want to do. They want to take a lot of, uh, I, I don't know what the right word is, but they want to... Liberties. Wanna, I'm sorry? Liberties. Yes. They want to take a lot of liberties, make it more dramatic. They want to twist the story. And I said, no. And I said, you know, it, the stories are so unreal on it, on their face, and the facts are so supportive of the strange nature. We don't need to do that. And finally, about nine months ago, I was called by some people from Prometheus Entertainment. And uh, they're the same group that does the Curse of Oak Island and Ancient Aliens. And the president of the company called me into his office, and we sat there for four hours one day. And he said, Dave, you'll be the executive producer. You get to review anything. You get to approve anything. You don't like anything. We'll go back and do it again. Make a long story short, we filmed a two-hour special for six months, and I can tell you that the man is exactly how he states he is. He's a man of his word. It is a phenomenal set of work that they've put together. Right now, the rough cut is done. It's going back to a network to review. They're going to guess it's going to air Q1 of next year. But again, it's a two-hour special about my work. So depending on how it goes, maybe it leads to something else, a series? I think they hope so, yeah. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, let's jump into the new book. It's uh, It's scary stuff. It's disturbing, scary stuff. I mean, part of me, I hate to even say it. I mean, I look forward to the books and then I feel guilty about it, you know? And I think some of our listeners even comment about it, sending me tweets and emails that, man, I hate to say this, but I really look forward to hearing Dave telling me these bone chilling stories about terrible things that happen to people. But um, I mean, it's, I know when we started, we were talking about hundreds of cases in national parks and forests. And now it's not hundreds, it's in the thousands, right? Well, we're up about 1600 and I probably have another 300 sitting on the cabinet behind me right now that I just haven't gone through to vet to see if they fit but almost every day I get a new case from somewhere in the world and it takes a while at times to get the information through and many times I can't even get the information because of obstructions in that process and as we've talked about before our government specifically our government, doesn't want to give up that information. And even though we have the Freedom of Information Act and it's supposed to be that free release of information upon request, it doesn't happen like that. And so they, I know you said in the book, you wrote that they now consider you a commercial um, requester and they can charge you four times as much for a public record? Correct. That, that happened about a year ago. And I got notified by the Park Service that they were going to give me this uh, commercial requester tag. And what that means is that they're going to charge me, I think, $65 an hour for every request and all time that is committed to them. And uh, I, I put that on my Facebook and on my Twitter account. And some good souls came forward and said, hey, we'll do it for you. And so that's the way I've gotten around it. I've used people, listeners, that have gotten to me and said, hey, we'll help you do that. You know, we'll request and We'll just give you the information when we get it, and that has helped. And uh, but they they really don't want the information out there. They do not want you to have an idea of how many of these cases there are, or where the investigation stalled, or specifics about each of the disappearances. Do they? Oh, it's it's definitely an obstructive process. Uh, I was I held a conference a couple months or a couple weeks ago, and John Greenwald from the Black Vault was there. And you know John? Yes. Yeah, and his site contains some of the most uh, comprehensive lists of Freedom of Information Acts I've ever seen. And he, I even went through it all with him to make sure I'm hitting all the stones, doing it right. And John just said, Dave, I can't believe that, that you're, you're faced with this. This is unreal. He goes, first of all, to be a commercial requester, you have a website. You've done a movie. Uh, you have books and libraries. He goes, that, that should not be a tag they can put on you. And uh, I, I've even had attorneys contact me and said, hey, you know, what can we do pro bono to try to help with the cause? And that's never even helped. So uh, I really thought that maybe with a turn in the Park Service, they get a new leader. I thought that would change. Well, three months ago, I sent, sent Zinke a letter outlining 
what they wanted to charge me three years ago, $34,000 for a list of people from Yosemite and $1.4 million for a list of people from their entire system. And I said, hopefully the tide has changed and you understand that I'm trying to do a good thing here for the people and for the victim's families. And I would hope that at this point you could get the information for me and we could work on this together. He never even responded. Um, I should talk. Let's talk a little bit about how you are selective about which cases go in, because I, as uh, it's 1600 plus that are included in the books. But you have reviewed many times that number of cases and then you weed them out using various criteria so you don't sort of pollute what's left over. What are the criteria? So imagine an FBI profiler that's looking at a series of bank robberies. And he's looking, say, first of all, at the San Francisco Bay Area and trying to see if there's bank robberies there that fit a profile for a certain individual. Mainly, let's just say it's a white male, six feet tall, always wears a bandana, uh, simulates a gun, never shows a gun. He has these profile points that he looks for to grab another case. And using that same type of profiling system, that's what I'm doing with these missing persons cases. And I use a vetting out process at the beginning to ensure that we keep consistent, mainly if the disappearance is voluntary, meaning the person told his family, hey, I just want to drop out of society. I don't want to be involved with this anymore. I'm just going to take off. Or maybe it was a suicide. And any type of suicidal or mental health issues, we'll vet those out. And any type of criminal element, any type of evidence that there was a crime in conjunction with the disappearance, we'll vet that out. And then the last one is predation. Any type of animal predation at the scene, in the area, any type of thoughts that the search and rescue or law enforcement had that this person was maybe drug off and buried by a bear, cached by a bear, etc., it'll vet those out. So what we're left with is cases where canines, this is like the 99%. Canines come to the scene, they can't find a scent, or they don't want to track. And that's a tough thing to determine from the handler. Sometimes they'll walk in a circle and they, they'll lay down. Sometimes they'll walk up the trail 15 feet and turn around and come back. But there's a lot of cases out there where the person is not found by canines. And that's, that's criteria number one. Number two is they bring in FLIR. And FLIR is forward-looking infrared radar in helicopters. They'll fly the area, and they'll look for a heat signature from a body or from a live person. Or sometimes they'll even see a bear in the area moving through. And if there's no heat signature, there's no FLIR reading, that would be another, another big reading, another big point on our profile. And then boulder fields. A lot of times people go missing in or around a boulder field, or they are found in a boulder field. And I know that sounds odd, but the number of times this happens is phenomenal. Talking with Dave Politis about his new book, Missing 411, Off the Grid. Some very strange cases coming up in the next half hour. Uh, and we're talking about the profile points, how he separates uh, wheat from chaff as he uh, interprets the, the data that comes in from newspaper clippings and family histories and archives and, and sometimes public records. We'll be right back with more Dave Politis. Welcome back. So what are the criteria that Dave Politis uses uh, to include a case in one of his 411, missing 411 books? We're going down the list. Canines can't or won't track. Dave, pick up the story. Uh, there's also another one, and these things don't come out readily. If you study 100 cases, this is going to make a lot of sense. If you look at 5,000 cases, these things start to come out at you. Another one is, is that the victims travel long distances or get to phenomenal heights, meaning, say, a two-year-old disappears, and the grid sit down by search and rescue professionals, and their books state that a two-year-old should be found 95% of the time in two miles or less from the point they were last seen. Well, I have a lot of cases where these kids are found 10, 9, 10 miles from where they were last seen in the middle of the woods, and it makes no sense. Or when they're found, they don't remember anything. That's another key point. A lot of times when the victims are found, they, they don't have a memory. Now, in the movie, we went to great details to show these phenomenal distances. In one case that Les Stroud tried to replicate was a two-year-old boy disappeared at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, was found the next morning nine miles away over two mountain ranges, and we ended up tracking him down and interviewed him. He's a man now. 
and uh, the story is really, really strange. And he says, I have no memory of anything. And so the phenomenal heights, you know, thousands of feet up into the mountains, a two-year-old disappears, and yet they're found up, uphill, way uphill. You have one case in this book where a little girl is found on the opposite side of a really wide river. Um, right. Uh, she, she couldn't possibly have walked it or swam it. She was too young. Exactly. Uh, so the distances, the heights, weather changes in conjunction either with the disappearance or the search. And this can, this can be a lot of things, and you've got to kind of use some common sense with this. If at the time the person disappears, a thunderstorm starts, a windstorm starts, uh, a drastic weather change that affects the searchers. This happens a lot of times. And then as you're walking with a group of people, I've kind of coined this the point of separation. And if you're not thinking about it, it won't hit you right away. But there's a time when you're walking with this group and either you get tired or they pick up their pace or something happens and you get out of view. And that's the point that you disappear. And the group will say, they were just right there. I can't believe they got away. They were right here just a second ago. And then, boom, they're gone. And when they bring the canines to that location, that's when they can't find a track or they walk in circles, they do this. Time of disappearance is usually late afternoon. And this, this next one, I only found this out after either talking to the victims or digging real deep and finding it in a coroner's report or deep in a law enforcement report. And that is, is that the victim had some type of disability or an illness that wasn't obvious to the people even who they were with meaning that maybe they were a severe diabetic, maybe they had early Alzheimer's, maybe they were autistic. But it seems that this comes up more often than not, meaning that there's two ends of this intellectual spectrum that seem to be at play a lot, meaning you have a lot of people at one end that have severe disabilities and some type of illness or injury that, that puts them in this one end. And then on the other end, you have these physicians, physicists, and things that disappear that are equally bizarre, yet fit the same criteria. Uh, And then in this book, I figured this out, and it hasn't happened a lot, and it probably hasn't happened a lot because people don't talk about it, but there's an instance where a guy disappeared, and he happened to have a compass with him. And he talked to the law enforcement people, and he said, you know, it was weird. Part of the reason I got lost, I think, is my compass was malfunctioning the entire time I was out. And I wonder if that is something maybe inherent, inherently wrong with the equipment he had, or was there something in the environment that was affecting his equipment? Yeah, that's a, that's a weird one. Um, that pops up in UFO cases. I don't want to get too far down that road, but um, that pops up in UFO cases, uh, the crop circles. Um, yeah, that's, that's a weird one. That you mentioned about medical professionals. We're going to get into that more in the specific cases, but I, I don't remember that popping up in, in the other in the other books that where you isolate that, or am I wrong? No, and in fact, it was this book that I, I first heard about it, and I, I don't know how many times people are even carrying compasses these days, but, you know, we have these GPS devices and, you know, with phones and things that you can pull up trail maps on, so I'm not sure if it's happening more and people are talking about it. Hey, they survived, you found me, great, and that's the end of it, and they don't want to say anything. It's something I'm trying to keep my eye on more and more. I throw it out there because a lot of times when I'm on these shows, I'll say something, and then I'll get some emails coming later on, and they'll say, you know, I was in the woods one time, and my compass started doing circles on me, and I couldn't figure out why. Um, There's a boulder and uh, granite uh, that plays a role that it's hard to figure out. And I can imagine when you start telling this story to somebody, these boulders, uh, it's somehow related to the disappearances that uh, they arch their eyebrows at you. Right. And when I talk about granite and boulders, when I started this, I didn't realize that there's a lot of things in boulders and granite that, you know, maybe the common public doesn't even know about. But as I started this process of understanding where these cases were at. I took out a giant map of the U.S., and I I just started to put pins in the map of where these people disappeared. And after a while, certain areas started to grow very large. And the largest cluster of disappearances fitting this profile anywhere in the world is Yosemite National Park. 
Now, what does Yosemite have that other places don't have? Probably one of the largest clusters of granite anywhere in the world. And the disappearances in Yosemite, I'm sure the thousands of people out there are thinking, oh, you know, somebody went into the woods and they were on a long hike and they just got lost, they fell off a cliff and died, and nobody found them. Well, the reality is, is that there's a lot of these cases of super smart people who went into the park, dropped their stuff in a hotel room, and asked somebody, hey, you know, can we go here or there? And they give them directions to a location. They're on foot. They don't have a backpack. They don't have hiking shoes on. And they disappear. And this has happened more times than I probably told you about in these shows. But Yosemite, for some reason, has a lot of these very, very strange disappearances. Many times the people are never found. Now, Yosemite also has this unusual uh, activity with it in that the National Park Service, if I name a name and a location where somebody disappeared and I have somebody else request the report, the Park Service will give it up. Now, in Yosemite, if somebody names a name and asks for a report, they will never give it up if that person's missing. And it's only to that one park that they won't give up any reports. There's one case I've talked about every time I'm on this show, a girl disappeared named Stacy Harris. case is 30 years old now, or more. And they will not release any details about the case. About six months ago, they released this, well, they, they said, oh, we're releasing case files. They never released the case file. They released some pictures, some articles about her. They will never release the incident report, even though it's classified as a missing person report. Every missing re person report I've requested out of Yosemite has been denied. It's ridiculous. I don't, I don't get it. Don't they want the public's help with this stuff, get the word out? Um, let's talk about this book, Broad Strokes, uh, how many cases, how it breaks down. There, I mean, it's not, you know, you started with U.S. national parks and national forests. It's much, much broader, of course, now. Yeah, initially, I was looking at just the U.S. and Canada because that's where the information could easily be gleaned from. Over time, and as people realize that this is an international issue, I started to get more cases from overseas. Last year, I took a trip to Australia. I spent two weeks there, and it was a book tour. But in between that, I went out and I met a family that lived, that was actually a U.S. family, uh, Patrick and Elizabeth, Liz. And they helped us, and they took us around, and they showed us a series of disappearances that we were interested in near Laura, L-E-U-R-A. And it was directly adjacent to national parks. The profiles of these people that disappeared in that area were a direct hit to what we're talking about in the U.S. Now, it's the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Australia, and New Zealand would be the top places in the world right now where there are disappearances that match what we're talking about here. Now, I can almost guarantee for a fact there's other places in the world that match these disappearances as well. But for me, getting the information and getting reports out of these areas is difficult. Now, well, going and, there and doing it may be a, a probability, but as you know, that's super expensive to do. And the language barrier. I mean, you're talking about places where uh, English is uh, spoken mostly. Oh, of the yeah. cases that you yeah. have, yeah. And, and in fact, when we went to Australia and we uh, visited some firehouses where people played a part in the search, we talked to other people that knew these victims, and when you start to get down to the nitty-gritty, I mean, in one case, this woman disappeared, and in the press, they said that she had early case of Alzheimer's, early onset, and she had the first early symptoms. Then when we talked to friends of hers, they said, that was a complete lie. I don't know why they put that in there. And that has happened many times in the U.S. on cases I've investigated as well. They say there's Alzheimer's early onset, and it's a complete lie. And it might be to try to explain away to the public why this is happening. But in reality, it's not happening for that reason. You have some cases from New Zealand that are mentioned in this book as well. And I, I don't want to jump too much out of order here, but toward the back of the book and um – did you dig into those while you're on that same trip, or did these come to you some other way? It came to me some other way, and um, there's a there's a lot of rationale on those cases in New Zealand. And if you ever get there, they have 
big mountains like we have in the United States, say in the Sierras or in the Rockies, and they have a lot of area above timberline where there's, n- there's no big trees. And there's some disappearances there that mimic disappearances here in that a person's above timberline and there's no place to hide. And they're last seen walking through this area. And of course, it's mostly all rocky, bouldery area. And they disappear and they're never found. And their backpack's never found and their coat's never found and nothing's ever found. And in normal disappearances, people will start shedding things. You're carrying a backpack and you, you know, you're on your last leg. You're going to start getting rid of things. And it's not a wise thing to do. It's probably best just to stay in one place, huddle up on a knoll top or a ridge top, and wait for help and wait for aircraft to come and find you. But that's not how a lot of people do things when you're starting to, you know, haven't had food, water, etc. But these disappearances in New Zealand mimic the disappearances in the States and in Canada almost identical. And one of the things I talked about when I talked at the search and rescue conference was that in the books, the search and rescue books that are given to these volunteers and professionals that go out and look for these people, there's a 95th percentile. And they'll say, well, 95% of the time a person will be found in this area. But it doesn't address the other 5% of the times. And are we searching for 95% success or are we searching for 100% success? And I can't tell you the number of times searchers have said, you know, Dave, we've always thought about that, but we never want to talk about it. And then when they read the books and they realize, wow, these are just facts that he's put together. There's no opinions in here. There's no stating that there's a big monster out there taking people. What I'm saying is, is that these are facts that people all need to be aware of. And many search and rescue people have now stated, you know, Dave, we all know this is going on. We just don't want to talk about it. You finally put it in print. Well, uh, you referenced that uh, that 2012 uh, presentation you made to that annual conference of search and rescue professionals, and and I guess uh, it was mixed reviews in the sense that you told them some things that were uncomfortable for many of them there, and then afterward, privately, some of them told you that kind of stuff that uh, that they are interested in this, but it's it doesn't seem to be something they want to speak about openly. Well, during my presentation, I, I kind of took a breath, and this guy in the back row stands up, and he goes, well, I'm an Alaska State Trooper. And he goes, I'm going to tell you, Dave, that you're the first person who's ever wanted to talk about this kind of stuff. He says, we face this all the time in our searches. And anyone in here who's done a lot of searches realizes this happens all the time. And he goes, I don't know why we're talking about it more. And then his friend who's with him is another Alaska State Trooper, stands up and says, he's 100% right. Well, you know, and then I start talking about the 95th percentile, and a lot of people, you're 100% right, George, are very inco- uncomfortable talking about the topic because it's hard to argue the facts that are laid out. Well, I guess they're, they might feel guilty realizing that they've just done the 95%. It didn't go literally the extra mile. And that's, that's always a, a million-dollar question. Did they miss something within that two-mile radius, or did the person go outside that radius? Well, one of the other vetting points, profile points that I include that I talk about in my books is there have been hundreds of times where a deceased victim has been found inside that primary search perimeter, that two-mile radius, and they stumble onto it. There's a quote uh, from the New Zealand case that you uh, profiled, uh, Ray Cassidy, a guy who disappeared in 2001, an extremely fit 73-year-old uh, who was hiking with a group on Mount Gray in New Zealand. And uh, one of the searchers was quoted in Wilderness Magazine of New Zealand saying, this guy was uh, seen one minute, gone the next. He completely vanished off the face of the earth. I've been involved with SAR for 50 years and Every now and then, one of these cases pops up when you're completely baffled because there's no logical explanation for it. And then uh, one of the searchers is quoted as saying, it was ju- just as though someone had come down from up above and zapped him into a flying saucer. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. 
Uh, we're talking about Dave Politis missing 411 off the grid. We're talking way off the grid. And while some of these cases go back decades, there are a few that uh, we're going to get into in a moment that are up to the moment. I mean, this year, Dave, I was thinking uh, over the break that, uh, you know, we, we're going to get into in this segment some of the most recent cases uh, from this year. And I'm wondering, how far back does it go? I, I, I realize the challenge is that the record keeping, uh, that a lot of your criteria are, it can, are confirmed via records and that records only go back so far. But it, this could be happening throughout human history. So you brought up a name earlier, guy I really respect, and I've read a lot of his research, and that's Jacques Vallée. And one of the cases that I've documented in past books uh, occurred in 1752 in France. That's a confirmed case. And then just the other day, uh, I participated in a Kickstarter on a book that Vallée wrote just recently. And I happened to be going through that book, and I found another case from the 1500s that he laid it out, and I couldn't have wrote it better. It was like a perfect match for what we're talking about. So there are cases that go way, way back. It's just a matter of you'd have to get lucky to find records that would confirm that it fits your criteria. Yeah, and a lot of times someone goes missing, and they're found. Thank goodness it's over, and that's it. And there isn't a lot written about it. Other times there's a lot that's documented by people who intrinsically have some interest as to why certain things happen. And you can almost tell by the tone in the article from the reporter that they were as intrigued about it as I am today, and and they decided to write a lot. And, you know, it goes back to where it happened, the educational level at the time. I mean, going back hundreds of years, Hmm. there weren't a lot of people that had that, that kind of education, and hard to find. You've got uh, some material from this year that uh, that shows that it is ongoing, February, March, even April, starting with a, a guy named Danny Philippides. Remember that one? Yeah, this, this case uh, made big notoriety across the U.S. In fact, mainstream press picked it up because it was so unique. 49 years old, a Toronto fire captain, 28 years of service, uh, February 7th, 2018, 4 o'clock. He's at the White Face Mountain Ski Resort in Lake Placid, about 40 miles south of the Canadian border. And every year, a group of current retired firefighters make the trip across. They spend a couple days skiing. Well, he was with a group of guys. One of his friends got tired. He said, well, I'll take one last run. Almost exactly the words that Grant Cox gave his friends when he took one last run. And he disappeared. Well, Danny's personal property was still in the lodge. Car was in the lot. His friend said, hey, he's got to be on the mountain. And a six-day search, 7,000 hours, dogs, firefighters, nothing. And then, surprisingly, Danny calls his wife from downtown Sacramento and says, I have some kind of head injury. I'm not sure how I got here. I did take a ride in a truck for a certain period of time, like a trucker, and he dropped me off in Sacramento. And right now I'm at Sacramento International Airport, and I wanted to call you and tell you that I'm okay, but I don't really remember anything. Well, she said, call the sheriff. He calls the sheriff. They come out, and they take a picture of him wearing the same ski clothes and the same ski helmet that he was missing. He was wearing the day he went missing. And he came back and he spoke to the New York State Police about what happened. And they never released the details of that conversation. But the people in Toronto said that he was an absolutely rock-solid fire captain with no mental health issues. I remember reading about this case, and my first thought was, this guy slipped away with some other woman. He doesn't want to remember because he doesn't want to tell his wife where he's been. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably where a lot of guys' minds went, except that, you know, you could kind of, why didn't he take a better set of clothes to change into? He got a haircut, too, right? He got a haircut? Yeah, and some people emailed me about that, and this is what I said. 
Well, for, they said, well, first of all, where did he get the money for a haircut? And he also bought an iPhone because he didn't have a phone. Bought it in Sacramento. And what I tell people, I, I ski all the time. And I don't like taking my wallet with me. But I'll always take a credit card and slip it in my coat so during the day I can stop on the hill and get something to eat. So him having a credit card, but he didn't have his wallet and he didn't have his passport, and he told the people in Sacramento, hey, I didn't fly here because I don't even have my passport. So <laughs> I don't know how I got here. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, have you reached out to him? Have you tried to talk to him? No, I, I in those kind of situations, I'm sure that he's probably embarrassed, doesn't want any more press about it, doesn't want any more acknowledgement. He probably wants to get back to his routine. And if it happened as he said it happened, he's probably scared to death. And one thing about that case that really rang true to me was him saying that he had a head injury. And he was wearing a helmet. And I'd be interested to see if that helmet had any damage to it. But it all kind of fits in. Why would he say he had a head injury? That's amazing. You had another one, uh, Dr. Jonathan Torgerson, uh, a physician from Montana. This is also in February. So this, there's some interesting coincidences here. So Dr. Torgerson disappears on the 17th of February, 10 days after Philippides disappears. Torgerson disappears from Whitefish Mountain Ski Area, and Philippides disappears from White Face Mountain Ski Area. <laughs> and White Fish Mountain in Montana is also 40 miles south of the Canadian border, just like White Face Mountain. Huh. Is that just all mere coincidence? Strange. So Dr. Torgerson lived in Montana, was an emergency room physician, kind of a staple in the community. And he decides, and he tells his family this, that he's going to ski outside the bounds of the ski area and actually take a, pay, a, a padded path around the backside and make it down to the bottom. And a lot of people do this. It's, it's not completely going off trail. Part of, it, part of it is, but not all of it. And he took an avalanche beacon with him. That was smart. And he had his phone. And uh, he intended to ski the northeast side of the area. He never came home. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but there's a very wealthy person that lives up in northern Montana, Kalispell Whitefish area, and he's funded this organization called Two Bear Air, Two Bear, B-E-A-R. And what it is, it's a helicopter emergency service that will pick anybody up for free in that northern Montana area, and it's funded full-time with two pilots. It's an unbelievable service that's funded up there privately. Well, Two Bear Air searched for this guy for days, and the Flathead Valley Avalanche Rescue responded, the sheriff, North Valley Search and Rescue, Gallatin County, Lewis and Clark County, and they all thought he might have fallen in a tree well, and that's this area around a tree that has this deep hole in it that sometimes claims a, a skier's life. They searched those holes one by one all through that area. And they pinged his cell phone, and it was last on near a ridgeline near this area called Kona and Flower Mount. It snowed heavily. Wind was brutal during the search. They didn't find him. And it, to me, it's, it's strange, not only the facts surrounding this, but also it's a physician. And in... This book, Off the Grid, I write a, about a lot of physicians that have disappeared under very, very strange circumstances. And it goes towards that intellect on that far end of the spectrum that seem to disappear at higher levels than most. You know, we, we've talked before about can you carry something that would protect you, some kind of a location device or a, a beacon or a cell phone. And in this case, this guy, the cell phone pinged, but it, it certainly didn't stop him from vanishing. You know, and I wish the National Park Service would get on board with this because there is a device. It's a personal locator beacon. And uh, if you guys ever, people ever watch, uh, you know, Deadliest Catch, every boat out there on the Bering Sea has one of these uh, waterproof location devices. Well, you can buy one. It costs you a couple hundred bucks and it works off a satellite. And if you're lost, you need help, you activate it. 
and within 10 feet, search and rescue can come and find you. And these things aren't as well known as people tend to think. And when I go to conferences, I'm surprised how many people have never heard of this. Yet anybody who walks in the woods by themselves needs one. And what I tell people is that you never think it's going to happen to you. You could be in the middle of the woods on the backside of some trail, off off the trail, break your leg. <laughs> Chances are no one is going to find you and you're going to die out there. Well, the funny thing was, you know, here I am preaching about this. And I was in Australia two years ago filming a segment on a missing person. And what did I do? I was carrying a huge camera rig and it was raining. It had rained previously. I slipped over a boulder and I broke my leg. <laughs> I ended up being able to walk out with a straight break, but it was it was ugly. If I wouldn't have been if I would have been by myself, I could have been in trouble. So Danny Filipides on uh, February seventh, ten days later, Doctor Torgerson disappears on the seventeenth. Same day, Ryan Shutka. Now Shutka was an employee of a ski resort called Sun Peaks, and it's just outside of Kamloops, British Columbia, 120 miles north of the U.S. border. And I'd worked there the entire season. It was the end of the season party. And he's walking from the party to his house just down the street. And he disappears. Now, he knew this, like the, this area by the back of his hand. He walked it every day all year. Well, the RCMP sent in multiple search dogs, multiple helicopters, 100 searchers. There was no evidence from anyone that he left the village that he was staying in. And his parents, Heather and Scott, were on scene daily. His dad used to be a heavy equipment operator and brought in a backhoe and cleared snow looking for his son. Now, the weird thing was is there were a lot of closed-circuit televisions in this little community, and none of them happened to be working. So they couldn't see where his movements were at. And this search went on for weeks, and in fact, just up until a couple weeks ago, it was still going on, and his parents were still there. And I guess the hopes are is that with a spring thaw, they'll be able to find him. But how he disappeared in such a short period of time, walking such a short distance, there's only one other place I know of that things like this have happened, and there's two cases very similar to this that have happened in Whistler, British Columbia. One was a guy and one was a girl. The girl happened this year. Very, very similar circumstances. The uh, the idea of the cameras not working, is that sort of, is there something suspicious there, or is it just, you know, it's a remote area, nobody's paying attention to the cameras, or is it is it likewise coincidental that all of them are out? You know, in the U.K., I wrote a book called Missing 411, Sobering Coincidence, where I, I documented a series of young men that have vanished and were later found uh, in water. And it's strange the way those things have happened. But in those little communities in the U.K., there's a lot of cameras. And in almost every one of those instances, the person was seen, and then all of a sudden they weren't seen. And then the next thing is, a week later, they're found in the water. How they ended up in the water, that's the million-dollar question. But it's normally not a closed-circuit television issue and a lot of times they have given some insight by from searchers as to what might have happened. But in this instance, it's strange that they weren't operating. Um, and, and I don't know if you've gone this far as to find out, did they just stop at that moment, at that time, or they were out for a while? or you know, and does... I think these were out for a while. Okay. Um, one other one that happened in March. This is Thomas Malarkey. So Malarkey, this is in Bear Valley, California. And uh, he was an electrician. And this is an area where I've actually been through a lot with my daughter, Nicole, and my son, Ben. We, we spent a lot of time up in the Sierras, up around Tahoe. And in this area of Calaveras County, where they have the frog jump, Mr. Malarkey was a Richmond resident, and he had a cabin outside of Arnold, kind of near Bear Valley. And he liked to ski. He was an advanced skier. And his wife decided to stay in the cabin this day, and he went up to Bear Valley. Now, this is the second incident I've written about from Bear Valley. And you can add up all the ski resorts in the U.S., and there aren't a handful of them 
where, that have had these disappearances, yet this is the second one in Bear Valley. I've skied that place many times. I don't understand how you get lost. And I don't understand how they couldn't find you. But he disappears. Uh, the search is termed on March 20th after the California Highway Patrol and the National Guard helicopters were grounded because it was snowing so hard. And there was 35 inches of snow that fell in 72 hours. That's a lot of snow for that area. But there was an army of people that responded. And Calaveras County, Alpine County, CHP, Air National Guard, and many volunteers. The family gave an interview and said, this is one of the true, real mysteries that we'll never understand, is how our dad wasn't found. In the, uh, in the missing 411 off the grid, that you have all these uh, quotations in the back from search and rescue people dealing with specific cases. And the one that jumps out at me, I'm, I'm looking for it here, uh, pawing through the pages. I can't find it, but it was uh, uh, involving a, one of the rare cases where somebody comes back and they have shreds of memory. It's a little boy who uh, believes that he was in the presence of a big kangaroo. Remember that one? You know, and I, <laughs> I try to tell people, don't put a lot of credence into what kids say, but it's been a big kangaroo, a big wolf, a big dog. One, one incident, the girl said, the dog took my hat off my head as he was holding me and put it in, my, put it in its mouth. So kids have said the, the damnedest things, and you don't know if they're making it up or if it's truthful. But the big kangaroo one, that... That one was odd because I've never heard anything close to that before. Uh, you know, you, you take them all together, though. They remember a big dog or a bear-like creature. You've got also cases of what sounds like a Sasquatch carrying kids away. Um, you don't want to read too much into that and blame all this on Bigfoot. Um, but it does sound like there's a physical creature involved in at least some of these encounters of those who come back and have any memory at all. So there you are giving evidence to some of those people out there that are listening, George. <laughs> but I'm just trying to stir I, it up, Dave. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> what I tell these, these groups is that you've got to look at the evidence. And the evidence says that around these scenes and from where these people have disappeared, there's no tracks, there's no scent. So how is something getting out of that area without leaving behind evidence they were even there. And that doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, you've got that UFO community saying, well, you know, it kind of fits that abduction scenario. You've got the Bigfoot community living off the words that George Knapp just said. <laughs> and, and who knows really what's happening? And I've never said that any one specific thing stands out, because when you look at the overwhelming evidence, and you go back and you look at the geographical cluster map, it really throws it all into a loop. So the boulder issue is one that I've written about extensively, and I wrote a lot about it in this last book. And it has to do with granite predominantly. And the biggest cluster of missing people anywhere in the world that fit our profile is Yosemite National Park. And what does Yosemite have? But probably more granite than anywhere in the world. And one of the last stories in this last book dealt with a priest that was running from a group of people in the late 1800s, and he ran onto this giant piece of granite, and it said that the granite opened up and swallowed him. And a couple of days later, he said he was spit out. And what's interesting to that to me is that it was a religious figure, and at the time, we always thought that those figures that wrote stories that held a lot of credibility in the world. And for him to write that, I thought was pretty phenomenal. The um, Shenandoah National Park, there's one case I wrote about in a couple of books ago. I don't remember the name off the top of my head. But uh, walking around boulders and getting out of sight from people would not be something I would do. And when I'm in those boulder fields, I make sure that I'm with somebody. They see me. I see them. I don't know what goes on in those boulder fields, but it's not good. The whole thing with the clothes is so weird, and it's it's hard to get your head around it, but you have those cases where the clothes are folded. You have other cases where the shoes, there's always something weird happening with shoes, and, and they're, it's tough to explain it. 
Well, it's it's especially tough to explain, especially when you're dealing with kids that have walked, you know, 60, 70 miles and supposedly didn't have shoes on and didn't have them at the time that they were found. How did they make it those distances? And what I explain to people is that search and rescue people are so thorough. They're told to pick up anything on the ground and make a note of it where they found it because it could be relevant to the case that they're working. And a lot of times they'll bring in all kinds of stuff, and the vast majority of the time it's not related to the person that's missing, but it shows how thorough they are. One of the guys that uh, I work with is a guy named Harvey Pratt. He used to be one of the directors at the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation, and he's also a Native American chief. A couple of weeks ago, Harvey and I were talking about Native American disappearances on reservations. He had a conversation with one of the Bureau of Indian Affairs captains, and the question had to do with, how do they retrieve reports out of their system when they need to go to court, et cetera? And this guy at the time said that's one of the problems. They, they're having a difficult time finding out where these reports are going and how they're tracked. And it's one of those federal investigative agencies that seems as though it, it's an, it has the inherent problems that the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service has. Now, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they're greatly underfunded, and they don't have enough investigators. But the disappearances of women on reservations is a serious issue. It doesn't overlap with what we're doing, but it's a serious issue. Well, we didn't get to talk about it tonight, but the one last case involved a German individual that disappeared skiing on the Matterhorn just a month ago, and they gave up the search for him, and uh, he was a, he's a billionaire from Germany, and you know that they threw every resource in the book trying to find him, and they didn't. So I think that the German side of the equation has something that we really don't understand, but there's something there. And when you look at the physicist angle, why are these guys disappearing, and why can't we find them? That's a real bothersome question. Yeah, his name is Carl Haub, H-A-U-B, if anybody is uh, interested in trying to look up information. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, can't suggest it's strong enough. Missing 411 off the grid, the latest uh, in of David Polite's seven books. Uh, if you want to buy them, his website, we got a link on the coast site, canammissing.com. That's the best play, place to get them, right, Dave? Absolutely, and I, I really appreciate always being on with you, George. You come prepared, and I like Coast it. Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. Uh, Dave, as I mentioned, has been a loyal friend to us here at Coast, and especially to me. He promised he'd give us first crack at new and interesting material, and tonight he makes good on that promise. The stuff you're about to hear is unsettling, disturbing, scary, uh, but undeniably gripping. You can't look away when you hear some of these cases. And how was he able to whittle down the list, eliminate the non-anomalous cases? I think your reaction is going to be very much like mine. Clusters, 28 clusters of missing people in North America and associated elements found within those clusters. Welcome back to the program. My friend David Politis. Dave? Hey, George, how you doing? Good to have you here. Um, wow, I read this stuff today. I'm, I'm pretty much blown away. I, I think you probably get that reaction from everyone who's seen the book so far. You know, it's, uh, many are surprised that uh, I was able to bridge that transition from the forests and the parks into the urban areas and do it as seamlessly as possible. And I think, yeah, I, I, people are pretty surprised that or shocked that these are existing. Let's sort of uh, lay the ground rules for those who are not familiar with the material. Do a recap, kind of a, how you got started in this, what the cases are that you look at, how you weed them out. Weed out the ones that can be explained through prosaic means. So originally started by doing some peripheral research at a national park. I noticed that a couple people following me around the park. I was interviewing people that were employees of the contractors in the park, not National Park Service employees. And at the end of the day, I went back to my room and get a knock on the door, and there's a person standing there, and they say, yeah, I'm a National Park Ranger. I'm off duty. Uh, I have some information for you I'd like to talk to you about. They come in. We had a conversation, and they told me that uh, themselves and others that they had talked to had worked at several parks in the past and had worked missing person cases in those locations. And they felt that uh, some of the locations that these people disappeared were odd, 
there was a lot of publicity in that seven to ten day cycle and a lot of news coverage. And then at the end of the initial search, boom, it was over. There was no more follow-up. They themselves had looked for information on cases, and it was difficult to find, and they couldn't figure that out and couldn't understand it. And after talking to other people in other parks, they realized that there's something really unusual going on, and they think somebody should look into it. And they knew my background, and they said, you know, you should really devote a lot of time to this because there's something here. Uh, the next morning, I called a couple law enforcement guys on the way home. I told them the locations to look at and see if there were there was anything unusual. They called back in a couple hours and said, wow, there's something here. It's kind of how it all got started, originally focused on national parks and then branched out into U.S. National Forests as well. The National Park Service has a large contingent of federally trained law enforcement officers, law enforcement officers, and uh, they're throughout the national park system. These aren't the rangers wearing the Yogi Bear hats. These are actually dedicated law enforcement people that carry guns, issue tickets, and make arrests. They're better trained than most law enforcement officers in medium and small cities across the U.S. because they're trained at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Facility. They have an administration just like every law enforcement group. They understand the need for keeping information on suspects and missing people. If you look at most medium-sized and large-sized police departments across the U.S. and you look at their website, there's usually a section about missing people. And in that section, many times, there's photos and information about missing people. Every state in the U.S. has a missing person website. And the need to understand where people go missing, the circumstances of their disappearance, and the need to get publicity and to get that picture out in front of the public is known throughout law enforcement. That's why they put them on bags, they put them on milk cartons. It's really an important fact of the missing person investigation. Well, I filed the Freedom of Information Act against the National Park Service probably five years ago now. And I had an attorney call me back from the Park Service asking me why I wanted that. You know, it was red flag number one. Uh, I explained that that's an inappropriate question. You can't use that as a deciding factor. He says, well, we already decided anyhow. We just wanted to know why you wanted it. And I said, well, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, well, I know you claimed an author's exemption because you have a published book, but your books aren't in enough libraries to qualify for that exemption, so you, we disqualified you. What a total bunch of baloney that is. That's not in the Freedom of Information Act. Of course not. And uh, I said, well, can you point me to where that is? He goes, that's our policy. I says, oh, okay. I said, well, I'm interested in the number of missing people from Yosemite and from your entire system, as I had explained. And he came back and he said, well, we don't keep a list of missing people from Yosemite. And I said, well, that seems a little odd. You must have a list somewhere. He says, no. So I filed another Freedom of Information Act request because I thought it was maybe they were playing some semantics game with me on the request. So uh, I wrote it again, and this time I got a written response from the local regional manager for the Freedom of Information Act for the National Park Service, Cheris Wilson, out of Denver. And she stated, no, they understood the first time. There are no lists of missing people. And I said, well, how can that be? And she said, we rely, and this is a quote, on the institutional memory of our employees for that information. So I said, hmm. And she said, but we understand your request, and we understand you wanted to know if it was denied, if we could just quote you a price. So the price is $34,000 for a list of people, missing people from Yosemite, and $1.4 million if you want it for the entire system. Now, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and a lot of people have said this to me. They said, well, if you're relying on institutional memory, why, would it, why should it cost so much? Just call the people in and ask. But, of course... I never got the information, and that started a hunt for us uh, going through archives, talking to National Park Rangers, people, etc. And we came up with a pretty healthy list of missing people from national parks. And because so many of the criteria match people who disappeared in national forests as well, we started to include those. And part of that, the factors that we use to eliminate cases is a voluntary disappearance or a mental health issue with the person, we wouldn't work it. If the person, uh, if there was some relationship to animal predation or there was some, some associating factor that showed that maybe the person was attacked by an animal, we excluded that. We excluded any where there was some 
incident uh, or possibility of human-to-human violence. So those were all the factors that vetted out the, the peripheral cases. So then we stayed in the park with cases where the people disappeared, there weren't answers, the park service seemed to be standing in the way of us getting answers, and probably the cornerstone case to that, that is a girl named Stacy Aris who disappeared in the next city over from me in Saratoga, California. She was 14 at the time, and she disappeared in Yosemite National Park, and her and her dad and six other people were riding on horseback into the back range and they were staying some, at some cabins really in the middle of nowhere, Yosemite. And uh, they got to the cabins. Stacy got out, changed clothes. And her and a 72-year-old man were just going to walk over to the point and sit down. And she was taking pictures with a camera. Everybody saw him walk to this point, sit down. And the older man sat down. They were at about 9,500 feet. She told the man that she was going to walk down this rocky granite hillside to a lake that was maybe three, 400 yards away and take pictures. Well, the, the people saw the man. He never moved. Stacy walked down the hillside. She was never seen again. A huge, huge search that lasted weeks found the lens cap to her camera inside the periphery of a wooded zone around the lake, and Stacy was never found. So that was one of the first cases I went after pretty hard, named the date, the location, the person. This time I get a call from uh, an agent, a special agent, from the National Park Service police named you, why you? Calls me up the same thing, why do you want this case? I said, well, it doesn't really matter, but I just want it for some research. He says, well, you're never gonna get the case. I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, it's irrelevant, but you're never gonna get it. I said, well, then why would you talk to me like that? First of all, I'm, I mean, I probably have 15 other cases at this point from other national parks on missing people, so why would you stand in the way of this? He goes, no, you don't. I said, what do you mean, no, I don't? He says, you don't have other cases from other national parks? I go, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, then they must have been found. I said, no, they were never found. And I said, another question is, why isn't she in the national database for missing and exploited children? And he said, she is in there. I go, no, she's not. Yes, she is, you're lying. He called me a liar a couple times. It wasn't a good conversation. And he eventually said, you're never going to see this case, so you might as well just give up. And to this point, five years later, he's correct. Of all the cases I've named in national parks, I've gotten a lot if I name the specific case and date. Sometimes they claim that there are national archives and they don't have them anymore, even though the person's still missing. Other times they just say, well, we can't find them, but most of the time I get them. And if, at this point, if you, if you kind of follow the pattern of the national parks, okay, so I have an attorney call me, I have a special agent call me, and they're standing in the way of a missing person's case. You told me when I talked to him that it's just classified as a missing person, there's no suspect, there's no criminal involvement, and the case hasn't been picked up in 14 years. Dave Belitis, before we leave the subject about uh, your interaction with these federal agencies, tell me, what was the cost estimate they gave you? Uh, If you're going to get these records, it's going to cost you how much? So for just Yosemite, it was 34000 and if I wanted it from their entire system, $1.4 million. So they clearly did not want to give you this stuff. I mean, they were going to come up with one reason or another, and they still haven't done it. Correct. What happens, say, say somebody disappears in Yosemite, which is you identify in your missing 411 book, you say that's one of the main clusters, maybe the main cluster. Somebody disappears, they do post something on their website for at least a couple of days or something, right, with information about the case? Yeah, and it goes back to what those rangers said at the beginning, is that there's that 7- to 10-day cycle where... There's information available, there's a lot of publicity, there's a lot of kind of a show of force, as you'd say, and then after that, there's no follow-up, there's nothing. That's it. You've had some recent interaction, almost like whistleblowers coming through and sending you information, and you shared some of those with me. I don't know how much detail you want to go into, but uh, what are the things that those folks are telling you about uh, how it works on the inside? Well, that's that's a fascinating part of it that is slowly coming about, I guess, as the news comes out that we're listening and we have some other evidence, is that uh, in the past, I ran into, by pure accident with a friend of mine, a a special agent that was retired from the National Park Service, one of the people I really wanted to get to. And uh, we ended up having a long conversation, and I asked him, why would the Park Service be taking this position? 
And he went on to explain that he was actually investigating a superintendent from the parks for some major theft, and he was told by his superior, shut it down. And he goes, Dave, I had him cold left to right, and I, I, I was told to drop it. And he says, it's a total lack of integrity. Those were his words. He goes, from top to bottom, a total lack of integrity. You had a letter from uh, one guy who, I guess he was a former uh, Park Service guy who was telling you about um, how it was also shut down. A FOIA request were shut down. He said it was the only time that it had happened in the 40 years he worked there where they did not respond to a FOIA request. That's correct. Remember the details of that? Uh, well, there's, there's actually been three or four of those. One of them, uh, a husband and wife worked at a national park together as rangers. And they thought that there was something strange going on with the budget in the park. So as private citizens, they filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get a hold of the budgets that they had questions about. And they, they wouldn't give them up. And they, they appealed and they lost. And the next thing you knew, they were out of a job. I've also seen these uh, most recent communications you've had with the agencies, the on-the-record stuff, U.S. Forest Service, for example, as you're asking them. Uh, summarize those because they're also they're about as frustrating as the park service stuff yeah the, i had always heard unofficially from the u.s national forest service that they didn't keep track of missing people and i thought okay i want them on the record telling me a or nay so i filed a formal request and uh initially one of the foi people for them came back and said you know i don't i don't think we have anything i talked to one of our law enforcement authorities, and they said, we don't have anything like that. So I said, okay, can I have the name of law enforcement authority? And then they came back with a formal letter signed by an individual inside their system saying, no, they have no list of missing people, period. And what's interesting about that is that, like the National Park Service, they have a branch of the U.S. Forest Service that are law enforcement officers. Their job just like all police officers, investigate, look for, and keep track of. But apparently they don't either. Do you think that they, those lists do exist, that in some deep, dark vault somewhere that they do keep the lists? Or now do you think that they have uh, dispersed the information, if they ever had a list, that they got rid of it in case you get lucky and get a hold of it? Well, as another good journalist I know said, if they don't have it, they're idiots. If they do have it and they're keeping it from me, that's against the law. So either way, they should all be fired. Let's go over the characteristics, the laundry list of characteristics that tie your cases together, the ones that you have described in the first three missing 411 books. And the reason we're doing it, of course, is because these come up again in the cases we're about to talk about. So one of the first things that surprising to many people is that when they bring canines, bloodhounds in to track the missing person, that canine sometimes walks in circles, sometimes they lay down, sometimes they walk up the trail five feet, come back and look at the handler. And as somebody who worked around tracking canines for many years in law enforcement, I can tell you that those dogs live for the hunt and they're excited. And when they do something like that, that means there is nothing there. And on the cases that we work with, about 95% of them, the dogs do exactly that. There's no scent to be found. They don't want to work. Something, there's nothing there. Uh, there's a water relationship to a vast majority of the cases I worked in national parks and forests. There's a geographical clustering effect. And at the beginning, first three years, we're not even looking for this. And then afterwards, we thought, you know, Seems like there's a lot of people missing from Yosemite and a lot of people missing from Sequoia. And maybe we ought to just put a pin map up and put the locations. And we did, and we almost fell over. And as it went, as time went on, there were 52 clusters of missing people in North America. And yes, there are people missing outside those cluster zones, but the vast majority fall into those clusters. And those clusters run up and down the east and west coast through the Rocky Mountains. There's essentially none right down north to south in the middle of the United States, and there's clusters all the way around the Great Lakes, and that's where I say it comes back to water. And these are not uh, people that uh, some of them go wandering off by themselves, but sometimes they disappear amid a group of people. There's kids playing right under the watchful eyes of their parents, and then boom, uh, mom turns around and the kid is gone, and they never find them. 
You know, there was a, a reporter for the Huffington Post a couple years ago that wrote an article, and the title of it was Don't Be Last in Line. And he had read my books, and he understood that there's a first-in-line, last-in-line concept with this. First-in-line, last-in-line in a group of people where people don't have you in sight, for some reason you disappear. A lot of times you're not found. Now, one of those other profile points that I talked about a lot in the last two books is intelligence. And it seems that at both ends of that intellectual spectrum, there's a large amount of disappearances. Some people that have dementia or, or autism or some very debilitating disease, those people tend to disappear a lot and are never found. On the opposite end of that scale, you have physicists, physicians, academic types that disappear and are never found. And this isn't something that's happened just in the last 10 years. You can go all the way back many, many decades, and this has been going on. You know what it's like, Dave, and I'm sure it's occurred to you. It's like fishing, like something is out there fishing, and we're the fish. And sometimes, you know, they uh, they catch one and they toss it back. And sometimes they just put it back in the water, and sometimes they toss it up on shore and just disregard it. And sometimes they keep the fish. Uh, it, it seems to be that something lives there and fishes humans in those cluster areas, that it lives there. I'll, I'll even give you a, a different analogy along the same lines. As my son, we were talking about this one day, and he goes, Dad, you know what this is like? This is like you go to the arcade, and you look at that claw machine, and you look at the games and the toys down below, and you kind of have an idea of what you want to go after. You put the claw over it, and you drop right on it sometimes, and you get the one you want. You pick it up, and you move it away, and you're not dragging it, but you're picking it way up, you keep it for a while, and then you drop it out, and you throw it out another entry point. I thought, wow, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Well, needless to say, you need whistleblowers, insiders, maybe retired National Park Service rangers and investigators, uh, U.S. Forest Service folks, their family members who might have talked about this. Uh, you're looking for sources. So, folks, if they're if you're listening and you have that kind of information, if you know what goes on inside these agencies, what they're hiding, how they hide it, Dave wants to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Is there a relationship between the clusters and just the fact that those are the parks that are most popular? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there's there's some really, really big national parks, and there aren't a lot of disappearances there. But uh, the biggest ones, uh, Yosemite, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, uh, Crater Lake National Park, Rocky Mountain National Park. But then again, there's some like Bryce Canyon, Grand Canyon. There's hardly any. You and I talked years ago uh, when your first Missing 411 book came out, and I sort of offhandedly said, talked about it maybe leading toward urban cases, that eventually the research would, would lead you there. And you weren't quite sure. Maybe you thought it would happen. Let's talk about the transition from the rural cases to urban. What got you started on that? I got to give you some credit, George. I mean, uh, you're you're a smart guy. You keep your eyes and your ears open. And sometimes when you get into research like this, you get maybe a tunnel vision on just the national forests and parks. And after we had that conversation, I thought, you know, he's right. I've got to keep more of an open mind. I didn't really want to go into that city area because it's easy for people to say, oh, you know what, that's a human abduction, or, oh, you know what, he's, he's just trying to force this to tie into something. Whereas in National Parks and Forests, there's, there's no, you're not going to get a human abduction on a trail. And in all my years, I've never heard of one. For that reason, maybe it was easier to enter that arena without getting a lot of flack because there isn't much to be had. Now, going into the city, I thought, okay, I agree. There's probably some of this going on. But I, I actually was, after we talked, I was reading a lot of different material. And I was reading about a series of young men. All of them were described as college, super smart, athletic. Some, some of the articles said these are the smartest and the best of the best out there. And they disappeared. And they were later found under some unusual circumstances, all in the same sort of area. And right away, I started thinking, I, okay, so all these guys are super smart, the best athletes, described as best of the best, kind of fits one end of that intellectual paradigm that 
I had been writing about. So I said, okay, I'm going to start looking at this. And right away, when I got into the minutia of a few of these caches, I realized, wow, canines weren't finding a scent. There's a direct water relationship. There was a clustering effect after I looked at about 50. Kind of how it all came about. So it is your entry point, these particular cases that we're going to talk about in the next hour, it's your entry point to looking at urban cases in general because of the st- the characteristics that tie these together. But it's tough. It It's tough because, as you mentioned, there's so many other possibilities. Somebody disappears in a city, first of all, nobody gives it, it uh, a whole lot of uh, attention, maybe the person's family or something, but there can be so many other reasons why you can disappear. You disappear in a forest. There's only a certain number of things that could have happened to you. Uh, But city, it becomes really complicated. It does. And uh, because of that, I was real cautious in this book. I wanted to look at medical evidence, and there was a lot. Uh, I wanted to look at victim statements. There was a lot. Parental opinions, there was a lot. And there were even some newspaper people that jumped on board and thought, wow, what's, what's happening here is unusual. And... Like I said, I spent maybe 15, 16 months doing the research on this book. And darn, if, if there isn't, the, many of the disappearances in this book are in the same areas the disappearances from the first four books are in. Around water, a clustering effect. I mean, it's right there. The book or report that you had read by these other investigators, who were they? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? What jumped out at you and grabbed your attention in reading that? So there was a professor named D. Lee Gil- Gilbertson and a retired New York City detective named Kevin Gannon. And they wrote this book called Case Studies in Drowning Forensics. That's really probably what got me into it. And they talked a lot about a few cases. And it, it reads just like a textbook. It's the size of a textbook, and it's pretty expensive. Great reading. These guys did a phenomenal job. One thing that I think hurt them is that They were looking, just like I was looking at Parks and Forests, they were looking just at these type of cases. And they didn't have the ability to look at the entire spectrum of the U.S. like I had already looked at. And one of the other big mistakes is one of these people at the beginning started to make an association between some graffiti that was found around some of these sites and it wasn't found at all the sites, and they tried to make an association that certain people were doing this. But when you look at the history behind it, the number of countries involved, it's impossible that it's one person. It's impossible that it's a gang of people. Is, it, uh, is there an equivalent to the Park Service in other countries, that uh, agencies elsewhere, internationally, that might have lists of missing people in their jurisdictions? Funny you ask that, because somebody in Canada decided to file a Freedom of Information Act in Canada because their Freedom of Information Act only applies to their citizens. So we could file one in Canada, and they could just ignore it, and it's no big deal. Well, somebody filed one in Canada with the parks. I forgot what they call it up there, but they're equal to the national park system. They came back and said, too, we don't have any lists of missing people. Even though I've written a lot about Canada, a lot about missing people up there, and again, it just mimics exactly what's happening down here. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. In a moment, David Politis joins us again. His latest work, Missing 411, The Devils in the Detail. More incredible stories of people simply vanishing. David's next on Coast to Coast AM. This is the one topic that people come up to me and they are petrified. What is, what's going on, they say. And David, we've got more cases. Uh, This one of a missing firefighter. This has got to be as strange as any of them, David. Yeah, George, it's, uh, it, it kind of fits that profile that we've been looking at for the last five years and certain elements at this early stage of the search seem to point towards it fitting that specific workup that we do. Tell us what we know about Mike Herdman, the missing firefighter. So he he went hiking uh, up in uh, the Los Padres National Forest in an area called the Cespe Wilderness on June 13th with a fellow firefighter paramedic from Arcadia. Uh, Mike's a married man, father, has a small daughter, uh, he has a lot of experience in the woods. The guy he was with didn't have a lot of experience, but 
they hiked uh, far in to the wilderness, started to set up camp. Mike brought his dog with him. And just as they were setting up camp, Mike was wearing a pair of shorts and a shirt, and that's it. And for some reason, his dog just took off straight into the woods. Well, the individual that Mike was with saw Mike take off running into the woods for the dog named Duke. And that was the last that Tyler Byers, the other firefighter, ever saw of Mike Herdman. And uh, Tyler, Tyler stuck around, called for Mike during the night yelled for him throughout the night, eventually gave up and decided to hike out the next day, which was an all-day deal. So by the time that search and rescue finally got on it, it was probably a day and a half into the disappearance. Now what's interesting is that in the last five years, we've been doing research into the missing people in the woods scenario. And a couple of things about this are exactly on key for what we found. Namely, a lot of people disappear with a dog or chasing a dog into the wilderness. And this is exactly what happened to Mike. Second part of that scenario is when people disappear when they're found, they're found without shoes or other pieces of clothing. Well, Mike disappeared with no shoes. Now, now did he have shoes on when he went running into the woods? No. He did not. Okay. Which is kind kind of strange. I mean, you think maybe you'd take a... 10, 20 seconds, just throw your shoes on. Put your shoes on, yeah. But no, he didn't. Now, right after this happened, I got an email from someone and said, do you understand the area that Mike disappeared in? And I got to be honest, at the beginning, I didn't. And they sent me to a website, and the name of my latest book is Missing 411, The Devils in the Detail. The website they sent me to was developed in 2011 and hasn't been touched And it's about the Sespe Wilderness and the Condor Sanctuary that's in the wilderness. And darn, if the name of that website isn't the devil's in the detail. Oh, my God. I was floored. And the reason the guy came up with that is because there are so many devil names, geographical locations inside this area. There's an area called Devil's Heart Peak, which is in the center of the Sespe Wilderness, right near the Condor Sanctuary. There's another place called the Devil's Gateway, another place called the Devil's Devil's Potrero. And in my books, the reason I named my book that is because a lot of people over the last five years we've done research on have disappeared in those geographical areas where there's devil in the name. Now, this this gets stranger, David, by the minute. I, I tell you, the people that I'm around, that I talk to every day, that I work with, we look each other in the eye sometimes and can't believe what we found. Okay, so in Herdman's case, he goes running into the woods, chasing his dog, doesn't have any shoes on. How far do you go into the woods before you say, you know what, folks, this is futile. I'm not going to continue chasing my dog. I'll wait for him to come back. I'm going back to my camp. You don't keep going. He apparently did, or something happened. Well, there's, there's a lot of people that sent me emails that said, well, we think he fell as he ran into the woods, and maybe he broke his leg and he can't get out. And I explained that Tyler Byers took the search crew into the location where Mike disappeared. And there's been 200 people searching for a week in a grid pattern out of that area. And if Mike did break his leg, he can still yell for help. That's right. number one. right. Number two, they've had actually, they got permission from the Forest Service to throw drones up into the sky, along with uh, some helicopters with FLIR that are looking for a specific heat pattern from people. Thermal imaging. Correct. And they haven't come up with any images. Now, one thing that everyone was looking for was his dog, Duke. And searchers had seen him during that week running around, but they couldn't get him. And then on Sunday, June 22nd, uh, 11, what is that, nine days after he disappeared, Duke showed up at the trailhead where Mike's car was originally parked. So he did come back. Came back. Did they catch him? They got him. Without Mike? No Mike. And they said that he looked uh, a little weathered, a little beaten up, just from the elements, and uh, they were going to take him in and give him some... uh, some injections or something and try to get him going, but the dog did not appear like it wanted to go back into the woods. 
Like it was petrified? I, I, that, they didn't use those words, but they said it wasn't, it wasn't in condition enough to go back in. You know, I know, David, uh, talking to you, that you don't want to speculate on, on cases like this. But there's got to be a point where even you have to come up with some theory yourself, correct? Well, and, and you bring up a good point, and everyone that I work with is constantly hammered about this. <clears throat> and let's go back five years. When we first started to do this, after the first year of just compiling cases and looking at 1,500 missing persons cases like this, we really didn't have a good grasp on much other than a few things started to fall out. And that being, you know, it was pretty obvious that people were being found without certain pieces of clothing or without shoes. They, a few cases started to show up where they were missing in these areas with hell or demon or devil in the name. And at the end of that first year, I got that same response. You know what's going on, and you just don't want to say. And I can tell you that there are reviews right now on Amazon for my latest book on a couple, from a couple of people that said specifically, if you thought that you knew what was happening after the first three or four books, wait till you read this book, and you'll have a, a drastic paradigm shift. Because in this latest book, we keep going with the elements we've discovered in the other books, but we gradually transition until you realize that this just isn't a land-based phenomena. And a lot of people thought it had to be a land-based creature, mm -hmm. entity, or something. That's not it. But I tell everybody, you better read at least one other of the missing 411 books before you read this latest one. Otherwise, the statistics and the data that we gathered you won't you won't be able to appreciate it because it won't make so much sense to you. Now let's let's talk about Herdman for a second. I mean, realistically, and this is conjecture on your part, but if a guy goes chasing his dog, I mean, really, David, how far is he going to go? Is he going to go, you know, a couple hundred feet, a football length away? He's not going to keep going into the woods, is he? Well, like I said, George, earlier, if it was me. I'm not going at all into the woods. I'm going to wait another 10 or 20 seconds until I can just throw my shoes on. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, he took he, his decision was, I'm going right now. Boom. Off he goes. But, I mean, you don't keep going. And it, let's assume something had attacked him for some reason. Don't you think his colleague would have been close enough to have heard that echoing scream throughout the, the woods? Absolutely. That, that never happened. Now, in many of the books... We write about cases where parents say, my child was right behind me and disappeared. Poof, gone. Gone. And if you hear it once or twice, you think, well, maybe the parents are just trying to rationalize it away, make the story sound a little better, make them feel better as parents. But we've heard this dozens and dozens of times. And you're not going to hear a scream. You're not going to hear something like this. I mean, we've documented 1,200 cases now, and many of them occur just like that. Are they falling into portals or other dimensions, as far-fetched as that may seem? You know, I'm not somebody that's going to say no to anything at this point, because there's something about this phenomena that's real, that we've documented through factual cases, that very few people have ever denied. And Herdman's case, we've gotten hundreds of emails saying, you know, you got to be aware of this, you got to be following this, and we are. And i got to say, up to this point, it fits exactly into what we've written about in the past. Of those who disappear, how many are found alive? What percent? Maybe 35. 35 percent are found alive, and do they say similar things, or are most of those cases what one would call natural disappearances, and they just got lost, and they got found? So part of that profile has to do with a large group of these people that disappear or also have disabilities. Namely, maybe they have autism, maybe they have some kind of t congenital older person's disease. Uh, maybe they disappear so young they can't even talk. And when they're found, they can't explain what happened. And of the people that do disappear that are able to talk, the vast, vast majority of them don't remember anything. In the last 18 months, we've named Mount Rainier National Park as one of the 58 clusters of missing people in North America through our research. Are they always with somebody or are they alone? 
You know, initially, they're with someone. And then for some reason or another, they get ahead of, the tra- on, of them on the trail, or they're behind them on the trail, or they get distracted in some means. There's not one common way, but it almost appears as though there's some segment of opportunity that comes forward, and it's in that brief moment of opportunity that something bad happens. There's, these things don't happen back to back to back in a specific area. Otherwise, everyone would take notice of it. These are always separated by eight, nine years minimum, sometimes 15 or 20 years. So you go from 97 to August 8, 2005, and Nito Mayo was a resident of Hawthorne, Nevada. She was a licensed practical nurse working at Mount Grant Hospital. And she was driving over into California to visit some relatives. She was driving a 97 Mercury Sable station wagon, and she pulled into Strawberry, and she bought some trinkets in the store. And after she left Strawberry, she drove out to the Vista, and apparently, from what everyone can find, the only thing that was missing was her camera and her keys. Her purse, let me correct that, her camera was was missing. That was the only thing. The camera. The, The doors were locked. Caltrans people found the car. The purse, the keys, the cell phone were in the car. And her prescription glasses, they also said, were missing. Maybe she took a picture of whatever. And you know, George, this is another subgroup that we've talked about in the books, and that is photographers. People that go missing in the woods carrying a camera with specific intent to take pictures. They vanish. Nita vanished, and they took the car as evidence. They've never had one clue as to what happened to this woman. And I wrote that up in one of the books. Now, fast forward... Uh, nine years, uh, April 22nd of this year, Patty Sue Albright, 46 years old, she owned a restaurant in Sonora, well-known in the community. She's going to go take a hike in uh, Kennedy Meadows, she told some people. For some reason or another, she turned into Donnell Vista Lookout in her Toyota 4Runner. The sunroof was open, and they found the car with the roof open. Apparently it had rained, and the keys to the car were gone. Her purse was inside the car, and she was nowhere to be found. Giant search of that surrounding area, she's never been found. Gosh, just doesn't make any sense. As, I, as I've stated before, whatever is doing this does it with 100% effectiveness. And it's, it's fast, and it's, and it's silent, apparently. Exactly. And they've never made a mistake, because if they had made a mistake, you or I would have heard about it. Somebody would. There would be some evidence, some pathology, something would find something. These forensics, they're too good these days. So uh, I'll tell you a story that came into us about two years ago. Is A person was hunting up in Colorado, and he said he was trucking along a trail, hunting, wasn't, was trying to get to a location, so was moving kind of fast. And he said he saw something ahead of him that almost looked like you were looking in a warped mirror that wasn't real clear. And he he goes, I slowed down almost to a a crawl, and I approached this. And he says, I swear to you, I put one foot forward as I was stopped, and I lost sight of my foot, but I could see part of my leg, almost like you're putting it into a wall. Wow. He says, I pulled my foot back through and started to back away because whatever it was was not good. That is amazing. Kind of reminds me of the Twilight Zone episode, Little Girl Lost, when she fell out of her bed, basically, and wandered into another dimension, and her father had to go in there to get her. And it was like a whole new world. It it does sound far-fetched, David, but you know what? I don't think we can rule out any of this. I agree with you. Mm. you got to tell me which way you're tipping, though. Tell me. (laughs) <laughs> well, again, a lot of people thought at the beginning that I had it nailed just because it happened in the woods. Mm-hmm. But as you move forward, and if you're a researcher and you stick with the profile that's established, but you keep an open mind. You've changed, right. Well, there's uh, the best example is there were three guys that were fishing off the coast of Florida, and they happened to be uh, jockeys, really, really good jockeys. They were going to be in the Kentucky Derby and uh, and Belmont in a in a couple months, and they were fishing in a small skiff that was being watched by a big yacht. 
immediately as they get in position in water that's only two or three feet deep, a storm comes in, part of the profile, there's bad weather associated with these disappearances, and a storm comes in to the point where they get washed away from this boat into a small little cove. Make a long story short, this boat goes in as far as it can. Not only were the three guys never found, none of their equipment was ever found, and it was in one of the biggest searches ever in Florida at that point. Weird. Like they were taken. Well, the author of the article, one of the articles we read said, these guys could have just gotten out of the boat and walked ashore. But they didn't. No, it was a small island, and yeah. they were never found. Somebody's taken these. Something is being... They're going into another dimension. They're being beamed aboard a ship. Something's happening, David. There is no doubt in my mind that something extremely unusual is happening to these people. And I wish I could nail it. And maybe with time, we can. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archive shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. Uh, to re recap some of the basics so that those who have not heard you previously understand about the kinds of disappearances we're talking about. First of all, the numbers, a, a general number that you know of so far. How many? At least 600, 650 right now. Most of them in national parks and national forests. And open spaces in North America. Uh, tell me about the clusters. So the first two books, we identified 28 clusters. We're up to, I think, 34 now. And those involved three or more people missing within geographical proximity to each other. And how many clusters do you have? I think we're up to 34, 35 right now in North America. What would be the top one? Yosemite? Easily. How many cases there? There's got to be at least 25. I remember my first reaction when you told me the, the general topic, and I thought to myself, well, gosh, yeah, people disappear in the wilderness, in parks, in forests. They get lost. They fall off a cliff. They get eaten by bears. What's so unusual about that? Walk us through some of the steps about the kind of characteristics that separate these cases from just a normal kind of a disappearance. After reading thousands of missing persons cases, certain elements start to come out at you, and they just they, they hit you in the face. Time after time, you read the same thing, and you, you start to say, how could this be? It's almost like it's a, a mimic of the other four cases in the same state. Um, a lot of times, the people disappear with a canine. Many times, if uh, they disappear overnight, bad weather comes into the area, rain, snow, etc. If people are found, many times they're found in a creek bed or river bed. Um, other times, if they're found, they're missing clothing or shoes. Uh, if they're found, an older person, they can't or they don't want to remember what happened. Other times, it's a disabled person to the point where they can't speak, so they can't communicate what happened. Or it's a very young child, and they can't speak at all. Berries, swamps, and boulder fields are three of the predominant things that keep coming up with missing people from the East Coast and the West Coast. And again, it's that clustering aspect. Um, if you went up through the middle of Northern California all the way to the Canadian border, that route of the Cascades has more people missing under unusual circumstances than I can ever tell you. And it has more clusters of missing people up through that area than any place else I can imagine. So those, I, those are some of the few. How many cases do you mention in, in the new volume? How many, how many are, are new? I think there's about 200 in there. And what are the, uh, talk to me about how many countries you now cover. Well, we, we included stories from five countries, uh, predominantly Australia, England, Indonesia, Iceland, and France. 
uh, and the, the Canadian, you knew there were going to be Canadian uh, cases. Did you know there would be this many? Well, if you look at the topography of North America, you, you kind of imagine that if there is some type of criminal activity or there's some kind of consistency and disappearance, it's not going to stop at the border. So we kind of presume that it would be happening up north. Dave, I want to spend a few more minutes sort of recapping for those who have heard this before and don't remember it, and for those who haven't heard it, why these cases are so weird. There are a couple of characteristics that really jump out at you. One is about where the kids, particularly kids, how far away they're found. Talk about that. That's one of the most unusual aspects to this. And when we first got into this, we read just about every search and rescue manual you could find. And when professionals go out into the field, they set up grid patterns to search for people. And it's based upon the topography you're in, based upon the age and the health of the person you're searching for. And for a child, say, under eight years eight years old, they're usually found within two miles 90% of the time, usually within the first four to six hours. Well, in the Western book that I wrote, I described a kid named David Allen Scott who was two years old. And, and I usually stop at this point when I'm talking to an audience and I say, how many people in the room have, have children? And I say, think back to when your child was two years old. How far could that child walk without dropping from exhaustion? And how fast could they move? How quickly could they get out of your sight? Well, David was with his family vacationing at a place called Mono Village, kind of on the eastern side of the Sierras, down near a city called Bishop. And uh, he disappeared from his family as he was down near a lake. And everyone initially thought he went into the lake. Make a long story short, they searched everywhere. They finally brought in some soldiers. And for some reason, they started going uphill. And they didn't go a little uphill. They went way uphill. And when you look at the valley that David disappeared in, there's a trail that almost goes straight uphill in a a zigzag fashion up, up this mountain. They went over the top of that mountain down into another, another valley, back up a uh, partial another mountain, total 3,000 feet, and they found him uh, behind a boulder. They tried to interview the soldier that found him, and they asked him if he had any injuries, and the soldier said no comment. I thought that was interesting. But that One of the stories in the new book involves a, a boy named Clarence Murphy, and he was vacationing in the central Sierras in a place called Camp Sacramento, which is at about 6,000 feet. It's a place where families go take their kids. It's right next to the American River. Yeah, that's a weird case. That's a a spooky one. Yeah, and uh, Clarence was vacationing with with his mom. He was in a sandbox at the camp, and his mom just stepped away for a couple minutes, and she came back, and he wasn't in the sandbox, and they had had a conversation, and he said he would stay there, and uh, they searched uh, initially, all the searchers usually go to the river or they go to the lake and they search hard there, and that's usually where kids end up in being found. But in the cases here, that's not where they're found. That's not where they go. And Clarence did the same thing that David did. And whether it was against his will or with his will or whatever, he went uphill again. And I can tell you, as an adult, when you're at 6,000 feet, and you have a choice between going uphill or downhill, you're going to go downhill because it takes the wind out of you at that elevation. And uh, initially, they searched for two weeks. They never found him. And they searched hard. They brought in every – they pulled out everything they could to find this boy. Well, fast forward from April 14, 41, 14 months later to September 22, 42, there was a deer hunter – that was up a ridgeline, 2,000 feet uphill, two miles from where Clarence disappeared, and he saw a shoe on the ground. But he was in an area that uh, would remind you a lot of Yosemite, because there's a place there called Lover's Leap. I've been in this area many times, filled with just huge pieces of granite, boulder fields. It's a hell-forsaken place, great place for deer hunting. And uh, this hunter was on his horse, and I think that's probably the only reason he he was there because it's so rugged. Another uh, weird aspect is the the inability of dogs to follow a scent. Uh, I think that was true in the Clarence case in that uh, Camp Sacramento. Absolutely. They, they brought up multiple, multiple canines. In fact, in every story in my books, the canines fail to pick up a scent that eventually finds the victim. Sometimes they go a ways down the trail, 
and then they lay down and they don't want to search, or there's no more scent. This past summer, I was asked to talk at the, the largest group of search and rescue professionals in the world in uh, Lake Tahoe. It's called NASA, National Association of Search and Rescue Professionals. I gave them the kind of the 50 cents edition because I only had an hour in front of them, but I, I gave them the outline of what we're doing and what the canines do. There was a line out the door of these guys wanting to talk about the same things that they'd experienced, but they thought they were just so isolated and unique. And uh, I, I've been around canines before in the police department when we searched, and these dogs just live for the search. For a search dog to just lay down at that time or not want to track these searchers that had the canines, they said it's, it's one of two things. Either there's no scent there, or it's extreme fear on the dog's side for some reason that we can't comprehend. I know in the previous volumes you had uh, instances where clothes were found uh, folded up uh, or, or laid out as if uh, in a ritualistic fashion. And I know in the new book you've got a case, I'm trying to remember it was, but it's an elderly lady who was found wearing different clothes from when she disappeared. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting case from uh, Central California. Uh, a woman disappeared. From, she's a very wealthy lady. She disappeared from her uh, kind of a rural ranch. And uh, there was a lot of suspicion that the family was involved and uh, a lot of inner griping going on and finger pointing, et cetera. But they didn't find her for months and months. And then uh, somebody said that they saw, they thought this lady picking berries off a berry bush in this remote location near Lake Berryessa. And uh, she was eventually found wearing overalls, like men's overalls, and shoes, where she was for the previous two months, how she survived, where she got the clothes. There were a million unanswered questions with that case, but in many ways it mimicked other elements that we see in these cases, so that's why it was included. I I would like you to address for a moment uh, the questions that are buzzing through people's heads. That is, why isn't it a bear or a mountain lion? Why couldn't it be drug smugglers or hermits or mountain men living out there that are abducting people and taking them away somewhere? And those are the first places everybody goes when they first hear me speak. And And I like to say that When we're speaking here on the phone, you're hearing probably less than 1% of the entire story. And so I really don't want anyone to go any place in their mind that can reconcile these thoughts. Because once you read the books, I have yet to find anybody that will say, hey, this is just bogus. Everyone reads these, and they, they will see that there's a commonality here of elements in each cases, in each of the cases. Now, one of the things about animal attacks is that If somebody is attacked, usually you have time to scream. You have time to make noise. And if it's an adult, you're usually going to fight for your life. And that fight is going to result in a huge disturbance on the ground. And dogs and canines are easily going to pick up that scent and track that down. The reality is, is that in all of these cases, animal attacks have been excluded. And they haven't been excluded by me. They've been excluded by search and rescue or by the law enforcement agency that's doing the case. Uh, Same thing for people, say drug smugglers out in the national forests. I mean, dogs could follow that scent as well if they were responsible. Oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, the last thing that uh, somebody who has a meth lab or somebody who's growing weed, the last thing they want to do is do something that's going to bring any law enforcement to the scene. They don't want to cause any disturbance. They don't, want to, they don't want to do anything that's going to bring any awareness to what's going on there. Think about that. And if it's an adult and they're going to try to take you, where are you going to go? And it goes back to, well, the canine is going to be able to track you as well. And it's going to be able to track scent, um, marijuana grow there. The flyovers are going to... F- they're just going to be in the area to such an immense degree. They're going to found. They're going to find it. And it's going to be revealed. Boy, uh, well, and it and it has to be frustrating for these lawmen uh, to be out there uh, often with so many resources, with hundreds of people searching to go through an area almost arm in arm and and not be able to find something, and then have the uh, the missing person appear in an area that they'd walked over forty, fifty, or more times. And you, 
I think the public sometimes gets numb to disappearances. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. We're back with Dave Politis talking about the case of Todd Geib, and uh, this case really gets creepy, Dave. Please continue. So, catch up is uh, a massive search. Todd isn't being found. Canines aren't finding a scent. Helicopters aren't seeing anything from the skies. All the swamps were searched. All the lakes in the area were searched. Nothing's found. His residence is on west side of a place called Half Moon Lake. Kind of on the right, on the correct side is the party. Party was on the west side of the road as well. And as the searchers are going, there's one small body of water on the west side as well, and it's called Ovid Hall Lake. It's about a thousand feet long, and it's narrow. It had been looked at many, many times. It's not easily acceptable. Some locals fish it. You can't drive to it, and you have to walk to it, and it's a tough walk. It's in the exact opposite direction of where Todd needed to go from the party to his house. Well, people did fish the lake from May 17th to May 18th afterwards, and they were using a fish finder, and they combed the lake from top to bottom, left to right. There was nothing in the lake. The people were interviewed multiple times. On July 2nd at 5 p.m., a husband and wife were walking down to the lake, and they saw what they described as something really odd protruding from the water. This is July 2nd. There's no ice. You know, it's a warm Michigan day. They walk down, and it's Todd's body. And the witnesses said in the reports that he was floating like a bobber. Todd's hat, his cell phone, and one shoe were missing. He was totally gone for, t- for 21 days. His location absolutely shocked everyone because it was on that opposite direction that he should have been going. The on-scene co- coroner classified in his report the case as suspicious, which is never done unless there's a crime involved. The coroner couldn't find any rigor mortis in the body. There was no ice in the lake. He couldn't determine if any lividity was present at all. And again, that's you, you always find lividity in bodies, except in these cases. Decomposition was classified as intermediate to moderate. He had the hair still on his head, and there was swelling around his eyelids. They couldn't determine the color of his iris. That's the colored portion of your eye. Now, when, you, when Gannon and Gilbertson looked at this case, they described his body as being pristine for being in the water 21 days, His blood alcohol level came back at 0.12%, just a little over the legal limit for driving. A toxicology showed that he had what's called continine. It's a byproduct of smoking. But highly unusual is they found something called despermine. It's a depression medication. Todd wasn't on depression medication. He wasn't taking any drugs. He was a very level-headed guy. They also found something called amitriptine in his system. And again, he didn't take drugs. They couldn't believe that they found this stuff. They couldn't determine the cause of death. It was listed as undetermined how he died, even though drowning was a possibility. They didn't find any water in his lungs. It's another case where the parents reach out to Dr. Cyril Wecht. He reviewed the case. He said that Todd had to have been unconscious when he entered the water. Photos The photos of the body were taken to a medical examiner's conference, and it was the unanimous opinion of all the medical examiners that looked at the pictures is that the body wasn't in the water for 20-plus days. The opinion was that Todd was out of the water 15 to 18 days placed in the water, and the family tried to get the Michigan police to change the cause of death. They wouldn't look at it. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. Now, everyone needs to understand something. Police departments, cities, counties, they work off of statistics. And most police chiefs want to keep that homicide statistic down because it's bad for business. And again, I'm going to present you with facts, not opinions about what's going on. The fact is, Todd wasn't in that water for that entire period of time. 
There are quotes that you have in the book from the guy's family, obviously pretty upset and upset about the determination that uh, the officials say it's not a homicide. How can it not be a homicide? This, You say he's a big guy. He died on land. Somebody had to drag him, carry him, toss him into that water. Well, and the other part of this that people can't forget is the positioning of the body that's being found in these cases completely outside the bounds of what's normal. What's causing the bodies to end up in this position? Nobody knows. But something unusual, highly unusual, is happening. And yes, the parents say things, but George, in every one of these cases, the parents are saying, there's no way this is my son. There's no way this happened. He knew this area like his backyard. He's not going to be walking in the other direction. But it's irrelevant. He didn't go the other direction. It's it's proven through a scientific forensics. Todd Geib and these other people that we've talked about were not in the water the entire time. Now, in my previous books, I write about these victims being found in areas that were previously searched. It goes back to the claw machine I talked about in the arcade. They're dropped into an area. They're placed into an area somehow where they guaranteed weren't in the area before. When they're found, if they're found, if they're found alive, they're found in this semi-conscious or unconscious state. You look at the whole book, and over and over again, these tiny little things that come up. I'm tired. Uh, I want to go home. I am not feeling well. I want to go home. Like something comes over people, almost as if drugs or something is put into their system without their permission or knowledge. It makes them not feel well, and then they go home, and then that's when stuff happens. It's like something is slipped into their system or their mental condition changes again and again. You look at one of those cases, it doesn't pop out at you, but when you see a pattern looking at it as you do from 30,000 feet, it becomes pretty striking. Exactly, and I think the, the mind of most would go right to that, well, there's a criminal element. You know, you slip something in the drink, but you got to remember something. The canines. There's no tracks leaving the area. The canines, there's no scent leaving the area. So even if somebody would have picked Todd up and carried him out of the area, chances are trackers, et cetera, would have tracked him out of the area. They would have found his scent someplace else. But then again, he wasn't in the water the entire time. So that means he was held. Nobody, I don't care who you are, in 125 cases leaves no evidence behind. And really, there's no evidence behind of who's doing this or what's happening. Whoever's doing it is pretty good at it. I would say perfect. Let's talk about Shane Montgomery. This is in Philadelphia, 2014. Now, in my previous books, I've written time and time again about the FBI. And the FBI are the best in the world at documentation. I don't care what you say. These guys are the be- These guys and ladies are the best. And they could go and they could sit and they monitor a case. They don't get involved, but they just sit and watch. And they listen and they write. And these reports go back to their profiling unit for review and classification. And they're the best at profiling. They're the best at at accumulating data. And in my past books, I've said that the FBI continually are on scene at some of these crimes. And they're writing. And they are not idiots. They know what I know. If... And, and I'm sure for a fact they know 10,000 times more. But they, they seem to show up. The Shane Montgomery case, to me, is a turning point for the FBI involvement because from the time Shane went missing, the FBI was on the scene. And just not the FBI agents themselves, the FBI abduction task force agents were there. Yet there was no evidence of a crime. January 20, or corrected me, November 27, 2014, is when Shane, 21 years old, Philadelphia, PA, he was a graduate of, of a Roman Catholic high school. I'll stop there again. You're going to continually hear me say that a, the majority of these people that disappear to have some strong religious affiliation. Shane did. Graduated from a Roman Catholic high school after, uh, and was attending Westchester University in Philly. On November 26th, he was at his cousin's house, and both decided they were going to go to a bar and have some drinks. At about 1.15 a.m., Shane sent a text to his cousin saying he was in the bar but couldn't locate his cousin. At 1.28, uh, he called another friend, 
and said, you know where my cousin's at? Got no answer. Couldn't find him. At 1.45, he bumped into something in the restaurant, and he was told that it's near 2 a.m. You guys got to leave. People said there was no way he was staggering drunk. He left the bar and was never seen again. He didn't uh, show up for a, a family event on November 27th, late in the day, and the family reported him as a missing person. From the first day Philadelphia police started working this event, the FBI was there interviewing staff at the bar at Cadell's Pub. This is the first time I've ever seen the FBI there interviewing staff on an incident where there was no evidence of a crime, and Philadelphia police said there was no evidence of a crime. They were just investigating. Well, the FBI doesn't investigate missing people. Now, they did locate a closed-circuit television footage of Shane crossing between a pub and a parking lot over a small footbridge of a canal. The footbridge passed over what was called Maniunk Canal, which paralleled the Shike Hill River. Shortly after he disappeared, the parents convinced Garden State Underwater Recovery Team to come in and start searching the water for their son because there was really no other place for him to go in their mind. And the first break came on December 21st, now, that was almost a, three weeks after he disappeared. This team is so good, they found Shane's keys in the river. Not in the canal they saw him walking over, but in the river. And that's, that, to me, is just unbelievable they found the keys. And the search was initially focused on that canal, but when they cleared it, they moved to the river. Now, what's fascinating about this is that one of the detectives on the case uh, was interviewed by a news team, and he was standing next to the river about, and they were talking about Shane, and he said, well, if Shane's in the river, he's miles downstream at this point because the river's flowing so fast. And they said, oh, okay, and they interviewed him about some other stuff. Well, the same underwater recovery team that found his keys in 10 feet of water con continued to look, and they looked behind a, a variety of locations in the area he was in. Well, Days later, almost a month after he disappeared, they found his body in an exact location right behind where he was seen in an area that had been searched many times behind a brewery. And this was in the exact location where he was seen on CCTV. Now, how did he end up in the river behind the brewery in a location that had been searched many times when the detective said there's no way he'd be anywhere near there, it'd be washed all downstream? That was funny. You know? That didn't make any sense. And the family said that the coroner told them that the cause of death was accident, but they never stated exactly what caused the, uh, the death. The body was assisted and reported and investigated by not only the FBI, but local Philadelphia authorities. And as of last week, the coroner and the medical examiner have never released the report on the cause of death, nor the blood alcohol level. Are you encouraged by this interest by the FBI? I mean, I guess you want the, the best detectives in the world, the best bloodhounds on the case looking at this. But then you have to wonder, well, maybe they know a lot more than you do, and they probably do know a lot more than you do, but would they ever release it as, you know, other government agencies have been reluctant to do? Well, I've filed Freedom of Information Acts against the FBI before in cases, and you get a redacted document that, one word of out of every 20 is readable and everything else is blacked out so you never really get anything. So in one sense, I think, well, yeah, they're, they're there. But what's, what's interesting about this is back when I was a cop, there was a girl who disappeared in Petaluma, California, named Polly Kloss. And the FBI were pulled, and, and they all flew in the next day, and they worked this case with Polly Kloss. One of the abduction task force agents knew one of our guys, and said, yeah, pick yourself and one other guy and come up here. And, and I was the other guy. And these abduction task force guys, they are the best of the best. I, I often tell people, you know, the average FBI agent probably doesn't put his handcuffs on person once a year. They are all ex-cops. They are really on top of things. If I ever had a family member disappeared, these are the guys I want looking into it because they are great. And... Yeah, it, 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 in a way, it makes me feel better. But in another way, I know that whatever they find, we'll never know. Because they'll never say, they won't even tell the other police officers working cases next to them what they know sometimes. I can't remember if the uh, FBI ever showed up in any of those National Park Service, National Forest 
missing persons cases, disappearances. Is there any hint that they are involved in any of those? Oh, yeah. In fact, in uh, Missing 411 Eastern U.S., I wrote about uh, an entire series of disappearances that occurred in the Great Smoky Mountains. And there was one specific FBI agent that was assigned to follow these strange disappearances of people in the woods. And I forgot how many times, but it was a lot of times. It was the same agent, the same name, time after time. And all he would say is, we're monitoring the case. We're monitoring the case. Well, when I interviewed one of the victim's dads, Dennis Martin, and uh, I asked him, I said, well, what is there about this case that I don't know? Because I think I probably know everything in print. He says, uh, you know that FBI agent that uh, worked all the cases here? I go, yeah, his last name was Reich. He says, exactly. He goes, do you ever know what happened to Agent Reich? I said, no. He says, he committed suicide. The book is called Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. Dave, is it out yet? Yes, it is. How do people get it? On our website, canam, C-A-N as in Nora, A-M as in Mary, canammissing.com. And do you sell it on Amazon or other outlets like that or just on the website? Funny you ask that. (laughs) No, we don't sell on Amazon, don't sell any of our books on Amazon, and the outrageous prices you see on Amazon are charged by resellers, not by us. Yeah, I hear that from some time to time. People will write and say, hey, your buddy uh, Dave Politis is really ripping us off. He wants 100 bucks for his books, something like that. Yeah, that's outrageous, and I would agree. And we try to stop it the best we can, but it's tough to determine who these resellers are. But they buy it from us, and they put it up there at some outrageous price. And all you have to do is just Google Missing 411. It'll take you, take you to our site, but uh, no, we don't sell there. I want to go back to the Todd Geib case before we get to these other two really weird ones because uh, there was something I wanted to ask you about that I I overlooked, and that was you mentioned he made four phone calls from what he described as some kind of a field. Were those two all different people? So this this is an important point because first one was to a friend, and then the other calls weren't made public who they made him to, but there's... There's an entire series of these that I write about in the book where right before the person disappears, and I mean right before they're on the phone or they're calling somebody, and then at that point, they're separated from the conversation somehow. And sometimes the people get out a sentence. Sometimes they'll say something like, oh, my God, where are you? Uh, it's, it's like your last word you ever hear from the person, and then they're, they're not found. One of those, I, rem- I don't remember which case it was, but you said the guy had dialed 911 and the call lasted one second, and then poof, it's dead. And sometimes uh, if you drop a phone on the ground, it will automatically dial 911 sometimes. Other times, maybe it was them actually looking for help. I don't know. In the Todd Guide thing, you mentioned something I didn't remember from the book, but I thought that, that the witnesses said it was the sound of either heavy breathing or wind, what made me, it made me think of is Todd flying through the air. George, you're not the first guy to think that. Uh, there were probably 25 of these books that went out as review copies, and I got probably five or six of those type of responses. And uh, it's hard not to go there right away. I try not to, but I think there could be something to that. Let's go to Stephen Kabaki. I've been saving this one, and I hope I didn't oversell it too much, but this just really blew my mind. And uh, uh, take it away. So Stephen, 23 years old at the time, February 19th, 78, another February disappearance, this time in Holland, Michigan. And it's interesting that we're talking about Todd Guy, but Holland is just north of Casnovia, also in an area where there's been these clusters of strange disappearances. And also, Stephen, again, was strong religious ties. He was going to Hope College, which is part of the Reformed Church of America. This location that he was at is 30 miles north of South Haven, 76 miles south of Ludington and Baldwin, the cluster area I was telling you about. In February of 78, Stephen was attending Hope, and this is the part that's going to sound strange again. He was trying to get a degree in German. Huh. (laughs) <laughs> on uh, February 19th, Todd told his roommates he was going to go cross-country skiing along Lake Michigan near Saugatuck, and when he didn't return, they filed a missing persons report. 
the Michigan, Michigan State Police uh, led the search, and they pulled out every stop imaginable. The Coast Guard on Lake Michigan went out, tracking dar- dogs, helicopters, foot patrols. And the state police found his skis and his poles on the beach of Lake Michigan, and they saw footprints on the ice leading out 200 yards out onto the lake. And they flew over it, and the footprints just appeared to stop. And they thought at the time that, because it had been a couple days, that maybe he had just fallen through the ice, and because there were no tracks coming back. And another report stated that they found his backpack in the same general area. So he was essentially separated from everything he had and apparently walked out on the ice. And the determination that after a couple of weeks' searches, police wrote down that they believed he died and drowned on the lake. Now, fast forward to May 5th, 79. This all occurred February 1978. So, you know, you're looking at about 15 months later. Stephen says he woke up in a field on a Saturday night, 40 miles from his father's house in Deerfield, Massachusetts. John Kubacki was his dad. 53-year-old father told in interviews, he goes, I thought my son was dead. And he said that he walked up to the door and said that he doesn't remember a lot. He woke up in Pittsfield, said he was lying in a meadow, and he was wearing clothes that weren't his. Now, this is 700 miles east of Lake Michigan, almost in a straight line. Now, in 1983, Stephen went back out and got an MA in linguistics from Ohio University. And in 92, he went back to the University of New Mexico and got a PhD in clinical psychology. I tracked him down into Washington. I called, tried to make an, uh, a contact with him, told the receptionist I wanted to talk to him sent him a personal email that I wanted to talk to him, he would never respond. And what's important about this, he's a missing student. He's missing in an area that is quoted as the Great Lakes Triangle, and I talk about this in my book. That is a great book that talks about a series of disappearances in and around the water of people, planes, and boats that are as unusual as the disappearances I talk about in my book. Stephen's missing time and space. And reporters asked him if he'd ever see a psychiatrist, and he said no, because I don't have any problems. So he had to have been interviewed by police, his family. Hey, where you been? What did he say? I wish I knew. Because it, in all of the articles I pulled on this, it never said that the police took an interest in it. Never said that, Because if you think about it, there was no crime that occurred. Remember, anybody can disappear, and it's not a crime. Now, there was some pretty strong evidence that he walked, I mean, there was factual evidence he walked out on the ice right directly from where his, his skis and things were. So where was he for 15 months? He says he wakes up in a field wearing somebody else's clothes. He said that the, there was other things in a small satchel that was next to him that were maps and things that weren't his, and he doesn't know where it came from. The thing about clothes, in his case and in other cases, it pops up all the time uh, that you got different items of clothing. I remember, and I know you don't want to be necessarily associated with alien abduction cases, but there are quite a few of those cases where people are wearing their clothes, but they're on backwards or inside out from when they went to bed. There's a missing time, a missing memory kind of a thing, and they've got their clothes are totally, totally wrong. This guy woke up with somebody else's clothes, seemingly in a trance, I suppose, yeah, we'll talk about the, the importance of that. You know, I, I, I think I've talked to you about this before, the work of John Mack. I've, I've read his books, and he was a psychiatrist from Harvard who was studying the uh, abduction phenomena, and he wrote extensively about some of the things we're talking about right here. And it's not that I want to ignore it at all, because I do see that there is some correlation in the facts between what I've written about and what Mack presented. Well, you don't want to box yourself into uh, a corner and, you know, you don't want people necessarily assume that you're talking about alien abductions, but these are abductions. There's, there, I don't know exactly who's doing them, but they are abductions. There's no question about that. I know that that word carries a particular context uh, on this program and these kinds of circles, but, and maybe you're not comfortable with that, but these are abductions, no doubt about it. 
Oh, no, and, and I think I'd be a fool not to admit that now. I mean, there's there's been some of the most competent police officers and detectives around that have said, hey, these are abductions. People don't want to admit it. They don't want to sit there and address the facts. But I'd go toe-to-toe with anybody to say, hey, show me that they're not. Stephen, uh, this guy we're talking about, he's gone for 14 months. I mean, couldn't he have just, I guess he wandered off, had a girlfriend he didn't want to tell the family about. He ended up living with her, and then he pretends he has amnesia when he comes back. Suppose. Again, anything is possible, but I think that the reality of the facts that presented themselves would say, no, that, that wouldn't be true. And unless Stephen was a very well-read guy back in 79 and knew about the clothing, the wrong clothing, the, the ill-fitting clothing, how would he know that this fits into other scenarios that I've read, written about? How would he know that this area of Michigan has had a whole series of disappearances that are equally strange to his. I mean, the parallels to other things are just phenomenal. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. David, always a pleasure having you on the program, my friend. How are you? Hey, George. Thanks for having me back. And, uh, Miss you guys. Uh, I hope you're doing well. And, you know, it's always a pleasure talking to the Coast audience because you got a great crowd here. I get more response from people about you when I'm at events and places that I go. I mean, this is a subject matter that, one, fascinates them, but scares the living day- daylights out of them, David. You know, I, you and I have been at conferences together and kind of get the same same feedback. Yeah. But I think the the people appreciate the data that I bring to support what I'm saying. And uh, the people that go out and actually do their own homework, they figure out, wow, (laughs) Dave was telling the truth. This really did happen the way he said. And there are few answers and a lot of questions. You were last on the program almost a year ago, and we were talking about some of your work, your documentaries and things like that. How has that been received? You know, George, it has blown me away. I, I got told by our di- film distributor a couple months ago that both of them, Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted, went to the top five in the world oh, that's on fantastic. Amazon for the number of minutes viewed. That's Congratulations. You, well, you deserve it. You have worked so hard with this strange story. Now, for people who are brand new to the program, and we always have hundreds and hundreds of coming in, Tell them a little bit about David Politis and how you got interested in this missing 411 story. Well, I, I spent 20-plus years in law enforcement, like you said. I had a master's degree in HR, and I came out, and I was hired right away into a technology company to be a director there for their HR group. Worked there for a number of years. And after that, I left. Did some research for some of the CEOs that I worked for, And then after that, I was at a national park. And strangely, there was a couple of park rangers following me around. And at the end of the day, one of them knocked on my door and said, hey, we know who you are. We know your research. We know you've written some books. We have a story to tell you. turns out that these guys worked at uh, different parks over their lifetime, worked on search and rescue teams. Mm -hmm. And they both realized that there was some strangeness going on, especially when they tried to get reports on missing people themselves. They were thwarted by the National Park Service. And they saw some consistencies, and they said, you know, Dave, somebody needs to look into this. So I left the park, called a couple buddies in law enforcement, and said, hey, this is what I was told. Are there a lot of people missing in national parks? They came back, and they said, yeah, surprisingly, Dave, there is. It's kind of how it all got started. And the Park Service has never been my friend. They do not want anybody looking at their data. They've claimed a lot of weird things over the day. Uh, On their website, they have a list that's probably 20 pages long of different films that were done on national parks, and they kept that list going for about 35 years. So they know the importance of a list. But when they're confronted and asked through a Freedom of Information Act request, we have a list of missing people from your jurisdiction. They say, well, well, we've never kept a list of missing people. Yeah, right. Which is completely garbage. 
You could go in any small, medium-sized police department and ask for a list of missing people, and the chief will have it on his desk in an hour. So for some reason, they didn't want anybody to really know who was missing in their parks. Now, lately, they've gotten a little better in the last three years. They start to release now at least posters of missing people who go in, in different parks and disappear. There's only one national park that's released an actual list of missing people, and that's Yosemite. And that's almost laughable because the reason they did that is I've written about everyone on the list they released. So as of right now, uh, I had written four or five books about missing people. Uh, I had a son that was graduating from college, going to USC film school. And ben came to me and he said, hey, Dad, let's really open up the exposure to these and let's do a documentary about it. I said, well, if you think well, he you can do right it. On. He was right Got on. Got some people together, and we did one documentary, and uh, it went over really well. And then we did a second one that even went over better. And that has given us exposure that we never thought we'd have. And I think that probably has turned the corner, that and uh, our YouTube channel, Can Am Missing, on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, George, I, I'm, I'm actually stunned that I have as many people – Oh, it's huge. Watching and listening as I do. But a lot of it, and I would say the vast majority of it, George, has to do with with what you and your friends at Coast to Coast have done for me, and I'm very humbled and grateful. When you look at the missing people, do you have a certain criteria before you put them in a certain section? I do. And that, after looking at uh, probably by now six or 7,000 search and rescue reports, missing person reports, I started to put stacks of these in different parts of my living room when I first started because there were certain things in each report that came up that I said, hey, I I remember that in another report. So I'd put it in that stack. And uh, after several years, uh, I called them profile points. It's sort of like uh, classifying each case like the FBI does as a profiler. Mm -hmm. And so um, like the most common one that I look for is if they bring canines, bloodhounds to the scene and the bloodhounds can't pick up a scent. And that's most of the time, right? About 97% on the cases that I classify and work. They can't pick up the scent. And, you know, that's, that's really odd to me because when I was a policeman, I worked on the SWAT team and we had the canine unit assigned to us. And, George, I cannot remember a time when we put the canines on a scent trail and they didn't find something. That they didn't pick it up. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, uh, canines can't find a scent. Oftentimes there's a weather change just as the person's going missing or as searchers arrive on the scene. They bring professional trackers in. They can't find tracks. If the person is found, this is a very odd one, I would say probably 50% or more, the victim's found in an area that has been previously searched not just once or twice sometimes 10 times. As if they're put back after the fact. That's right. Jeez. So uh, many of the people have some type of disability or illness. If the person's found, they have a lack of memory, oftentimes about what happened, how they got missing, etc. Many times when they're found, they're missing clothes, shoes, personal items. And then something came up when I started to do a book on missing hunters. And I noticed that oftentimes hunters will go out in pairs. And sometimes during the hunt, they'll split up and hunt different areas. Right. And I call that the point of separation. Because immediately after that happens, something happens to one of those people. And it's like almost as though something's watching them. So when they separate, they're alone. And it's not just hunters. It could be hikers. It could be a lot of things. The other one is uh, oftentimes there's boulder and granite in the immediate area that they disappear. I wrote a book, uh, Missing 411 Eastern U.S., where a large percentage of the stories dealt with missing children. And in that book, I chronicled kids that were found an extraordinary distance from where they were last seen. So now, of, of, of 10 people who disappear, how many are found? I would say probably 40%. 40% are found. In the cases that I work. Some have an interesting story to tell in that, you know, hey, I I don't remember how I got here. I don't really remember where I've been, and I can't really explain how I got lost. 
They don't even remember the beginning of the disappearance, do they? No. No. And uh, after I, I worked up probably 600 cases, I found that in the United States, there was a geographical clustering effect of these cases. And in North America, there are 62 geographical clusters. And then there are subgroups of missing people. And those are berry pickers, hunters, mushroom pickers, sheep herders, people of German nationality. How bizarre. Yeah. And um, there's this, I call them falls. They look like falls. Everything appears that they fell. But then when you go back and you investigate, a fall doesn't make any sense. So how did the person get there? And then one of the last things I do before we bring a case in is we vet the case for animal predation. Uh huh. Okay. And search and rescue teams do this as well. And for people who don't know, if you're out in the woods and you get attacked by a mountain lion or a bear, that victim is going to fight for their life. And there's going to be torn clothing. There's going to be a big dust up in the area. Screams, everything. So uh, that's ruled out. And then specifically, if there's any indication uh, that the person wants to take their life, I won't work that case as well. So when you have the profile points and you go through the vetting process, and then you look for the subgroups, then I look for where in the U.S. this happened. If it was one of those clustering areas, that will give it priority. And just so everyone knows, the biggest cluster of missing people anywhere in the world is Yosemite National Park at least for the cases that we've identified. And how did you key in on Idaho, which we'll talk about after the break? Well, that was, <laughs> that was pretty easy for me. Uh, I knew that I wanted to start studying on the state level because I wanted to go to the locations. I wanted to see for myself. I wanted to report for myself while I was there in the books. And so uh, when I moved to Montana, first book I did on the state series was Montana. Well, Idaho is right next door, and I knew from the work I'd done before that there's a lot of really, really weird cases. I've been looking at the cluster map, David, that you sent us. Uh, We'll talk about that, too. It's truly remarkable and scary. Now, let's concentrate on missing 411 Idaho. You keyed in on this. You sent me a geographical cluster map, which is frightening, to tell you the truth, David. I mean, people were missing all over this map. Yeah, it was a a pretty spread out uh, distribution. I would say uh, as you go north towards Canada, it starts to thin out a lot. But uh, in the heart of the state and in some of the most wild areas of Idaho were some of the most unreal little clusters of people that went missing. I mean, on some mountains, there's as many as four or five people that disappeared. And over what time span? So... uh, People sometimes get frustrated with me because I'll talk about a case from, say, the late 1800s or the early 1900s. And the truth of the matter is those interest me more than the cases do today because we study history for a reason. If this was just an event of the last 20 or 30 years, then we could say, well, maybe it's something related to the technology that our government has, let's just say. But if I can say that these these disappearances – with the same profiles, go all the way back to the 1600s. And we know something else is at play. Yeah. And that's why I like to chronicle all cases. As far back as I can go back in the archives to look, I'm going to bring it forth. And if it matches, it's going in. Does it de- uh, determine the, the, the sex, men, women, who who is missing the most? Or is it about 50-50? You know, it's predominantly men. But I, I think that's a logical answer and a, and a good reason is that they generally go out the camping more right yeah but you know then again in, in the last year or two i've been out with uh angie and we'll, we'll be walking around in the mountains and, and we'll see single women coming down the trail i would say almost more single women than men in the last couple of years and that scares me a lot because a lot of these women like I live in Montana, so we have grizzly bear. You'll see them walking around, and they don't have any obvious gun, and they don't have an obvious bear spray. So that does concern me. And one thing I I like to plug every time I'm on your show, George, is personal locator beacons. A lot of people don't They're know. They're very smart. Are. Go ahead. Tell us what they are. So 
it's, it's a device about the size of a cell phone. And it, when you activate it, it sends a signal to a satellite that you're in distress. That satellite sends it to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They look at the GPS that is coming in, and they will send the closest search and rescue to find you within 10 feet. Now, And almost immediately, won't they? Oh, well, as soon as the search and rescue team can get there. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of people don't even know that this technology exists. They're about $300. There's several manufacturers. But the, the thing is, is that I do believe that a lot of missing people, especially people that are going off trail, would be found alive if they had these devices. Because what I tell people is um, I was in Australia a couple of years ago on a book tour, and uh, Angie and I were in a national park there on a missing person case. And I was carrying a big camera rig on my shoulder, and I slipped over a rock, and we both heard a loud crack. And I fell down, got myself together, didn't drop the camera rig, pushed off on one foot. My other foot hurt like you just shot me with a shotgun. And Angie said, she's a nurse. She said, you know, you either blew all your tendons or you broke your leg. So we made it through the rest of the trip. My leg blew up like a big basketball and finally get back to to Colorado. And the doctor says, uh, well, we know you didn't broke your leg, break your leg because you've been on it for the last three weeks. Jeez. So we better take an x-ray. Turns out it was a clean break. The point being is that if you're by yourself and you break your tib fib or your femur, I guarantee you're not walking out of there because the pain is excruciating. So... If you didn't have a personal locator beacon and you were off trail, there's a good chance you're going to go out there and you're going to die. I did not count the number of missing on this cluster map, but how many would be here? Seventy. Seventy people. Seventy people. Over what time period? From the late 1880s up until just a year ago. And so what is that average? Maybe five to six people a year? You know, there's wild swings and... Trying to make sense of that is hard to do. But some years, you can go three or four years with nothing, and then all of a sudden you'll hit one year, and two people, three people, four people maybe go missing. Uh, in this book, there were a lot of people that were hunters that disappeared during different time intervals. But one of the things I, I tell everybody, before you go out and you go camping, or even just for a Sing, sing along day hike, always check the weather because a lot of these people were caught and it's hard to tell if the weather was, you know, something that was understood that was coming or whether it was not. But a lot of people were caught by weather and then search and rescue was caught by weather. And sometimes the people were found, sometimes they weren't found, but it's not normal not to ever be found. Well, that's true, and it's just bizarre. Could you cite a few cases for us? So uh, I was talking earlier about distance traveled. So uh, there was a, a man named Lawrence Marsh, and he and his wife had a son that was 19 months old. It happened in June 15, 1907, and it was about 15 miles northwest of Caldwell, Idaho, and that's about five miles west of Boise. And they lived in a very rural home. Well, at about 6 p.m., the parents couldn't find their boy. They called for him, yelled for him, ran around the yard. They couldn't find him. Well, they go out, and they get every neighbor they can, and pretty soon they have 100 people looking. And then they call. One of the people had the ability to get a hold of the local sheriff. The sheriff comes out, gets some uh, firefighters out there. And then the sheriff sends a, a man, one of his men, to the local penitentiary to get the bloodhounds out to that site to help him look for the kid. Well, the bloodhounds came out. They ended up searching for 16 hours. They weren't finding anything. Well, on June 20th, about five days after he disappears, they're looking around, and one searcher by himself thought he was way too far but he just had a hunch, and he was walking around, and he found a few of the boy's tracks. And then he walked up on the boy, and he was still alive. 
and he was eight miles from the house. Eight miles. Jeez. 19 months old. Now... Defies logic, David. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some people will say, well, yeah, you know, my, my kid's real energetic. But to make it over a span of time that long and to still be alive and to cover that much ground, because people don't understand that young children, they live by habits. When it gets dark outside, they'll lay down and go to sleep. And they, don't, they won't get up in the dark. They'll sleep and get up in the morning and dilly around in the dirt a little bit. A lot of times search and rescue people say, number one, they never walk a straight line. So if they're gone eight miles from the point they were last seen, they probably walk 16 miles if they walked it. If they walked it. And what are the odds of that happening, that they walked it? Well, astronomical. Uh, I think it defies everything in search and rescue manuals, and it defies common sense, George. What do law enforcement officers say about this? Not the parks people, because they don't say much. But so, what, what does the rank and file officer say? Well, there's a lot of them listening right now. And uh, oh, yeah. I have a lot of fans out there because I hear about them all the time when I make a video. But uh, a number of years ago, I was giving a presentation to the largest search and rescue organization in the world. It's called NASAR. And uh, I gave the statistics, and I talked for about an hour and a half. And at the end, two Alaska state troopers stand up in the back of the room. And one of them speaks for both of them. And he says, you know, Mr. Politis, it's the first time I've heard this in coming to this organization for years. But we need to talk about this more. And he says, you don't understand that this happens in Alaska all the time. We deal with this stuff routinely, and nobody wants to talk about it. Crazy. Everybody wants to sweep it under the rug, forget about it, and move on. They found the person. They found the body. Let's forget it. Let's go. But he says, you know, it's refreshing. Someone's finally talking about it. So I think that there's some search and rescue people. <laughs> I hear about this all the time that they believe that this is their turf and they don't want to say anything about what happened during that search. Other people are really transparent and want to talk about it. Uh, there's a group out of British Columbia that historically has had some of the strangest cases ever. And their leader of their search and rescue won't talk to anybody about what happens. And it's like I, I think he's afraid that someone's going to make fun of him or someone's going to challenge him on what he says happens. But the truth of the matter is what he's reporting is happening all over the world. And um, I've written about this stuff in 16 different countries over the last 11 years. So it's nothing confined to just North America. How many people go missing in the United States every year? Well, that's a slippery slope. And uh, the FBI will report, you know, there's 100,000 kids that disappeared last year. Or they'll give this wild statistic. And the truth of the matter is, I think the general public gets swayed by this and thinks we have some kind of huge problem. The reality is, is probably less than one quarter of 1% of that number is remotely related to what I do. That number includes a runaway. Somebody who's at their house, teenager gets mad, runs away for two days, comes back. Mm -hmm. That same kid runs away five times in a year. That's five cases. Five cases. And the reality is that 100,000 number, probably by the time it's reported, 95% of those people have been found. A lot of them, they, there's, it's not against the law to just fall out of society if that's what you want to do. But the ones that are classified in what we do, they're truly unusual, a very very small percentage. I know I've tried to uh, tie you down, David, with your own theory on what you think is happening, and uh, you won't go there. But uh, you must think about this a lot. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, you know this, because when we go to conferences, we meet a lot of people face-to-face. -face. They'll talk to you. They'll ask you questions. And I love the face-to-face because I've heard a lot of things right. that you never hear when you're on the radio or when you're at home. And they'll tell you in confidence, hey, you know, this happened to me, but I really don't want to say it and blah, blah, blah. And the truth of the matter is the more I hear these stories, the more I start to think, well, it can't be this, it can't be that. Like an example, uh, I have some people, several people 
that have owned property that's been in their family for 50, 60 years. Every year they go hunting on the same piece of property or they go hiking. And they say, Dave, there's a ridge line. I've walked down it a thousand times. One time I'm walking down the ridge line, and then all of a sudden, everything in front of me doesn't even look familiar at all. There's a pond there. There's I even saw a cabin. and Like they walked into a different dimension or something. Bingo. And they said, you know, I don't remember crossing into anything. I don't remember weather change. But he says, I was there for maybe an hour. I was scared to death. Then all of a sudden, I walk out, and I realize where I am. And Dave, I spent 10 years trying to find this cabin or this location again. And I don't think it exists, but I don't know what happened. And I've heard a similar story probably 10 times from different people. I think that the, the, the portal opening theory may be one of the best and provocative that I've heard so far. What do you think? So I made a show called Vanished, and you can watch it on Amazon. It's, it belongs to the History Channel. But it's a two-hour special I made for them about this disappearances. And uh, over that show, they introduced me to several different people, and one was a physicist, Dr. Brandenburg. And uh, we talked as much off-camera as we did on-camera, and he's a, a consultant for NASA. And he yeah. told me, you he's, know, he's been on the show before. So <clears throat> I was in Wisconsin visiting Dr. Brandenburg, and we are filming, and we started to talk about portals. And he said, you know, Dave, he said, I'm part of a group of physicists, theoreticals that sit around and talk about this kind of thing all the time. And there's groups right now in the world that are trying to weaponize a portal. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he says, so imagine pointing a portal at like a battalion of troops and just taking them away. Just suck them up. Yeah. And I said, so this is feasible? He goes, yeah, we think it is. Oh, my gosh. And he said, you know, Dave, I know about your work. And he said, you know, about the stories about the kids standing right next to the parents. and Or that time where somebody, a hiker is ahead of the group, around the corner. The group comes around the corner. The person's gone. It's like somebody was watching them, and they were gone. And he says, so it, it almost falls in line in my mind, this is Brandenburg talking, that somebody already is using that technology on your participants somehow. So this, this isn't me. This is part of the conversation with Brandenburg as well. He says, you know what we don't understand is that time from point to point. Where are they going? What are they doing? How long are they in this limbo stage? Mm-hmm. And then we had this talk about Star Trek when people are beamed up from a planet under the Enterprise. Right. And he said, so it, some people don't make that trip well. Some people may get hung up. We don't understand it. I can tell you that according to Brandenburg, who, like I said, is a consultant for NASA, he's a smart guy, it's something that they're researching right now. That's bizarre. I did not know that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's something strange going on. I mean, it's obvious there's something bizarre going on. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah. It is one of the strangest, most frightening stories that you brought to us I have ever ever encountered in my career. Hands down, David. Well, you know, one thing that uh, when we were talking about portals with Brandenburg is if they were random, if they were not manipulated, then why couldn't somebody walking down, you know, Broadway in New York... Stumble into them. or, Or see somebody in front of them disappear. Poof. But you don't hear of that. No. There was one weird story I heard about, I think you did too, of somebody dressed in 1800 garb, that kind of style, and he seemed to just pop up in Manhattan, and he got hit by a cab and killed. And they, he had no identification on him, and they had no idea who he was, but the cab driver said, he just popped up in front of my cab. And uh, he was dressed in 1800, you know, the year 1800 year garb. I wonder if he fell into a porthole and came through into the future. Well, that's pretty odd. I'd, I'd have to say that uh, I'm sure the poor taxi driver was stunned. Oh, he was. Probably the strangest one I've heard in a number of years is that uh, a hunter was 
elk hunting in uh, Colorado, probably about 10,000 feet. He was right up above uh, Timberline, and he was walking through some grass. And up, at, He wasn't paying a lot of attention. He was walking back to his car, and he said that he lifted his head up, and ahead of him it looked almost like a fog bank. And he kept getting closer and closer to it, and he said it was like a curtain, and it wasn't like uh, slowly walking into fog. And he said he walked up to the to this wall kind of thing, and he lifted his foot up, and he put his foot through it, and that portion of his leg disappeared. Jeez. And he pulled it out, and he said, uh-uh, I'm finding another way. And he turned around and walked and got out of there a different direction. But I... I asked the guy, I said, well, what do you think would have happened if you just had your head down, you're walking down the trail, and you just walked into it? And he goes, I don't know, but I was scared to death. It seems like you are leaning toward this kind of possibility, a portal. You know, George, I keep an open mind because there's too many things it could be at this point. And if you look, there's cases on different sides of the United States, sometimes on the same day. Right before the book came out, when I was proofing it, uh, Angie and I spent a week in Idaho going to all these spots. And one of the places, probably 20 miles outside of Grangeville, just east of there, is a place called Elk City. Now, Elk City is famous in my mind for an incident that happened there. And I've got to set this up. And it involves two cases in one day, George. Two. And right. the first one involves a woman named Connie Johnson. Connie was 76 years old, and she was a U.S. Forest Service backcountry ranger for 20 years. And she worked at the Moose Creek Ranger Station off of the Selway River. Well, when she retired, she started working for an outfitter as their camp cook on Fog Mountain. And she was last seen when they dropped her off at the camp on October 2nd. Now, on October 2nd, they just dropped her off. Her job was to set up the camp, and the hunting guides came out. A couple of days later, they tried to reach her on the radio. She said something, but they couldn't tell what it was. On October 5th, they go in, and they can't find her or her dog that was with her when they dropped her off. So that bothered everybody. They knew that she wouldn't get lost. And what happened was is that Eventually, the world came in and started looking for Connie. Now, at Elk City, right outside of Elk City, there is a place called the Penman Mine, P-E-N-M-A-N. And there was a film crew there at the Penman Mine on October 5th, 2018, same day Connie disappeared. And they were filming a segment. And one story was is that this production crew out of the U.K. was filming about ghosts Another segment said that it was part of uh, this show about searching for gold, whatever the story was. We went there. We talked to the people who were on scene, and this production crew hired some locals to drive in on ATVs up this rugged dirt road to this mine. And they were standing around at the end of the day on October 5th, and everyone's standing around, and one of the members of their team looks at everybody, is standing at a super steep hill, and just takes off at a dead run into the middle of nothingness. And this guy, everyone just looks stunned, like, where's he going? Yeah. And they said he ran like the wind, and nobody ever saw him again. One of the couple of the crew members tried to chase him down, couldn't do it. So they go back down the bottom of this hill, and the first house they get to, is one of these guys who lives part of the summer in this area and uh, hunts in that area during October. And I met this person, and he said, Dave, the crew was stunned. Nobody could believe what this person did, and it was all validated by this local and this team that brought him in there. Make a long story short, now they have two missing people, big cases in the same jurisdiction in the same county, and they're looking for these people. Well, in both instances, neither person was ever found. In Connie's case, her dog, Ace, turns up 14 days later, 14 miles away at 
the U.S. Forest Service camp where she worked at for 20 years. And the dog walked up to uh, one of the pilots that's working on their plane on the dirt strip, and everyone knew who the dog was. They ended up bringing the dog back into the hunting camp, hoping to take him to Connie, but the dog didn't lead that way. But in one of the strangest things I've ever documented, number one, two cases in the same county in the same day, different incidents, both people never found, no explanation, completely bizarre. So another story, uh, when we were filming Vanished, we were at Mesa Verde National Park, and we were there about a case of a man that disappeared there named Dale Staling. Now, Dale just took off on a normal hike. People saw him on the trail and he was in a great mood, and then he just suddenly disappears. Well, a couple days later, search is going full bore. A local newspaper reporter had a meeting with the park superintendent about just the park in general. She was going to write a story. She didn't even know anybody was missing. So she gets there, and it's chaos. And the superintendent says, hey, go take a hike or something. Come back in an hour, and I'll give you the interview. She doesn't know it, but she goes down the same hike, same trail where Dale disappeared. And about three miles down the trail, she stops because she hears somebody calling for help. And she goes, where are you? And the person isn't answering. They just say, hey, I need your help. I'm hurt, blah, blah, blah. And she's very flustered. She runs back to the superintendent's office, runs into their meeting, says, hey, guys, we got an injured hiker out there. We need help right now. I'll take you guys out there. And they say, well, where is this? She says, and the chief ranger standing next to the superintendent says, yeah, that's the same spot two days ago. Somebody heard the same thing. Wow. We sent, we sent I don't know, four teams of searchers out there, searched for four hours, never found anything. Now, two days later, they're hearing the same thing, the same location. So, to your point. <laughs> they fall into that portal, and they can't get back. That's the other interesting thing. I wonder why they can't come back. Do you imagine, if this is happening to people, how horrible it must be for them to be lost in this other dimension, not being able to find their way back? Unbelievable. Well, you know, uh, there have been reports of electronic anomalies in conjunction with these cases. And that could be some of the aircraft crashes. Uh, there's also been reports that cars have stalled. Uh, some people have had compasses that just spin endlessly. They don't operate. Yeah, this has happened. Uh, having electronics, this isn't something that would normally be listed in the reports. And it probably should be if there was suspicion. Right. But you got to remember that the search and rescue people that do this, 95% are people like you and me, George, that are volunteering their time to go out and look for people. And when they find somebody, they aren't thinking anomaly. They aren't thinking unusual. They're just thinking this is a normal missing person. If we find them, great. Let's go get them. They're deceased. It's too bad. Uh, there's an area in the middle of the United States that extends down into Texas and uh, goes from North Dakota, South Dakota, straight down through north to south, where there's hardly any disappearances, and it's very, very odd. When you look at the U.S. cluster map, it's, it's unexplainable almost <laughs> why this one area of the U.S. has almost nothing, and immediately to the right, starting at about the Mississippi and going east, and then starting in probably the Colorado-Kansas border going west. But down through the middle, there's hardly any disappearances. Did you have a story that I think you told us last time that uh, some hikers were hiking and their friend was about 20 feet behind them? They turn around and he's gone? George, I have probably 30 stories like that. Jeez. Um, Poof. When I first uh, wrote my first book, it was a story and uh, they were hiking down a trail, and I caught last in line. And there was a series of disappearances where the person who was last in line disappeared. And it was, didn't make any sense, except that nobody had eyes on that person last in line. Why do these state park patrol officers not like talking about this? They're territorial. They think it's kind of their area, and they don't want to let people know what's going on in their area. 
and some of them don't want to talk about it. Now, surprisingly, I get them talking to me every once in a while, and I, I'm greatly appreciated, and I'll never give up a source, but that's the way I hear about some of these things, because they'll call in and say, Dave, I was on the search, and you know, here's really the facts about what happened behind it, and then I know what to look for, and I'll go after it. It's, it's strange how we end up where we do in life. If you would have asked me 20 years ago, Dave, where were you, where were you be in 2022? I never would have said I'd be here. And uh, I've had many people tell me that uh, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be doing this. You know, my son gave me a gift of the movies and the YouTube and supported me in the effort to get to where I was going. And, you know, without him, I wouldn't even probably be talking on the phone. So I'm, I'm very grateful for what's happened. I'm going to just ask you questions on percent. We've got a minute left. People are disappearing because of UFOs. Give me a percent. If they are, they're not saying, George. Bigfoot. Um, and you wrote you know, a book. When I was it. doing that type of research, I heard of one case uh, in Northern California in the 1800s. And that's, that was it. Portals might be the biggest. It might be. And, again, it's one of those things that I have no firsthand knowledge of it. I can only surmise just from talking about it from people like you and me and hearing these stories that there's something unusual going on. Absolutely. David, let's not let a year go by next time before you come back on. This book is called Missing 411 Idaho. It is unbelievable. It is available through his website, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archived shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. 